Hello and welcome. I'm Judy Burkhart, Executive Director of the Nursing Programs for Kaplan, and welcome to this discussion of safe and effective care environment. We're going to be talking about this topic and it's divided into two sections. The first one is management of care and the second is safety and infection control. Let's talk for a minute about management of care. Management of care comprises about 7 to 13 percent of the questions you'll see on your NCLEX exam. And when you're dealing with management of care, you need to consider the philosophy of healthcare in, in the United States today in order to correctly answer questions. And healthcare in the U.S. is really focused on three different areas. The first is health promotion, the second is the concept of wellness, and third is illness prevention. And when you're talking about prevention, there are three levels of prevention. The first is what we call primary prevention, and this is really true prevention. What you're looking at or, or, or for is actions that prevent or delay the occurrence of an illness. A good example would be eating well-balanced meals, um, maintaining a good weight, uh, participating in a regular exercise program, refraining from smoking, um, children getting immunizations, uh, wearing seat belts. Again, all the, the safety issues and prevention issues that you take place or you um, engage in every day. The second level of prevention is what they consider secondary prevention. This type of prevention is the early detection of a disease or a condition, and clients are either experiencing health problems already or at high risk for developing certain problems. Good examples of secondary prevention would be the yearly pap smear that women of childbearing ages should have, um, TB screening using the Tyne test, uh, blood pressure screening for adults, or the, year, uh, the yearly mammograms, again, for women. The third level of prevention is what we call tertiary prevention, and in this case, there is already a permanent disease, defect, or disability, and the idea is to try and minimize uh, the effects of it and help the client um, have optional functioning. And a good example of this would be um, rehabilitation after a cerebrovascular accident. So again, um, health in the United States is focused on health promotion, wellness, and illness prevention. And as you go through the questions um, on the exam and as you prepare and, and review content, you want to make sure that you know what the responsibility of the nurse is. And nurses in the U.S. are responsible for first predicting potential problems, that is being aware of what could happen, hopefully preventing the problem from occurring, and then helping to manage problems that do occur. So again, the goal of the nurse is to predict, to prevent, and to manage. So let's talk about the professional nurse. The professional nurse has specific knowledge and skills. Um, this is, you, you have gone to nursing school and you've learned a lot of information and, and you have knowledge and abilities that you can share with your clients. The second component of a professional nurse is the fact that the nurse is person-centered. It's, it's not about me, it, it's, it's about the patient and, and the clients that you deal with. A third component of a professional nurse is the fact that the nurse can form and does function in, in an autonomous um, uh, way. The nurse is independent and able to make competent decisions. Gone are the days when the nurse had to stand up when the physician came in the room. Uh, nurses are no longer considered handmaidens of the physician. Uh, there are independent nursing activities that the nurse can and, and should do. Another uh, concept of a professional nurse is accountability. The nurse is responsible for the care given, and nursing practice is governed by um, standards of care. It's governed by Nurse Practice Acts. Um, each state has a particular practice act that governs what should and should not be done um, to care for patients in that particular state. So when you're dealing with or thinking about professional nursing, there are three components. The first is care, the second is cure, and the third is coordination, where the nurse works as part of an interdisciplinary team to provide for care for patients. Let's talk about the nurse-client relationship or nurse-patient relationship. Um, this relationship has certain characteristics. Um, the first is that it is a helping, caring relationship. And again, this relationship is different than um, a peer relationship or a relationship with your children or a relationship with your parents. So again, it, there's a helping relationship. The nurse offers information and provides information to clients and patients. The nurse helps clients and patients make decisions and um, improve their health and prevent illness. Again, the nurse works with the client to hopefully change behaviors in a very positive way. Another uh, 
a characteristic of the nurse-client relationship is that the nurse and client work together as a team. It's not the nurse telling the client what to do. It's not the nurse giving advice. If I were you, I would. It really is a team effort. And the more you involve the patient in decisions about their care, the more compliant the patient will be, the more in control of their life they will be, and the more likely they will be to, to go along with what will be health, healthy for them. Another characteristic of the nurse-client relationship is the fact that it's the nurse's responsibility to act as the client's advocate. That means to speak for the client, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute. And the last thing about a nurse-client relationship is that it is a protected relationship. There are certain um, characteristics, and one of the chief ones that I will refer to several times in this tape is the fact that there is there's confidentiality involved in a nurse-client relationship. Um, information that's shared between the patient and the client is kept confidential. Chart information is kept confidential. So you need as a nurse to be very aware of where you talk about patient information. If you're in the hall or if you're in the cafeteria, you need to be careful about who you talk with patient information about or, or who you're with and what responsibility they have toward the patient. So it's a very collaborative relationship. So the nurse collaborates with the client and the family and the nurse collaborates with other members of the interdisciplinary team. And that requires communication. And let's talk about communication. Communication is one of the underlying themes for the NCLEX exam. And there are two types of communication. The first is verbal, and that's very easy to understand. That's either what you say, I'm participating in verbal communication with you now, or uh, the written word are both forms of verbal communication. And that's very upfront and you know what it is you're dealing with. The second form of uh, communication is what we call nonverbal communication. And the thing to remember about nonverbal communication is that it is culturally driven. Certain cultures have uh, different rules, if you will, about what is accepted and non accepted for nonverbal communication. And when you're talking about nonverbal communication, it's how you communicate a message without using words, or, um, either written or spoken. It's uh, body language, it's personal appearance, it's uh, posture. You know, I would give you a very different. Uh, picture if I were all slumped over and you know versus standing erect and and engaging with you as I talked with you. Facial expressions have a, a lot to do with um, nonverbal communication. Eye contact, you know, whether we make con eye contact as I talk with you versus I'm talking with you and I'm I'm looking away. Gestures you make. Um, some people like me talk with their hands. Other people. Um, it, it, it just, they don't uh, engage in that. And one of the other um, concerns or issues with um, nonverbal communication is personal space, how close you get to the people as you talk with them. Um, and again, important for you to remember that nonverbal communication is culturally driven. There is such a thing as professional communication. Again, the way you communicate with your patients and clients and the way you communicate with members of the interdisciplinary team is different than the way you talk with your spouse or your children or, or your parents or, or siblings. Again, it, it should be courteous, not that you don't talk courteously to everyone, but again, you use names when you're talking with patients and clients. It's not uh, the patient in room 203 or the gallbladder patient or that type of thing. It, um, it needs to be um, on a more personal level where you actually use the patient's name. Again, privacy and confidentiality when you're communicating with and about patients needs to be paramount. Again, the uh, professional communication needs to be trustworthy. You need to be able to be trusted with um, very highly sensitive and, com and um, information that is highly confidential. And again, the nurse um, or the professional communication that the nurse engages in should be assertive. Now, there's a difference between assertive and aggressive. An assertive person, again, if I'm acting as your advocate, I will be assertive with what I do and I, I will work with you and, and for you. Aggressive um, is a very much in your face, um, very confrontational type of behavior, and that doesn't fall um, under the realm of professional communication. Let's change topics a little bit here, and we're going to talk about the Patient Bill of Rights. Um, the Patient Bill of Rights, if you've been in a healthcare setting um, anytime recently, and I'm sure you have, you've seen this uh, most of the times it's posted on the wall. There are rights that patients have or, or clients have, and let's talk about some of those, because it is the nurse's responsibility to uphold the patient's rights. Um, the first right is privacy and confidentiality, and we talked a little bit about that. Unless the client consents, the nurse is unable to share confidential information with um, anyone 
other than those actively involved in the care. So again, be very careful where you discuss the patient. If you're sitting in the hospital cafeteria and talking about Mr. Jones and the fact that um, his HIV status came back and he's positive and you're overheard by other people, you have broken confidentiality. Um, and again, there may be questions on the NCLEX exam dealing with this where you're given a situation where the nurse does something um, and you have to be able to recognize the fact that that nurse broke confidentiality in discussing the uh, care of a patient or a patient status, for example, with the, um, the housekeeping team or, or someone who happened to be in the room and said, how's Mr. Smith doing? And the nurse gives chapter and verse about how Mr. Smith is, is really doing. That's breaking confidentiality. That's inappropriate. So again, you can't divulge confidential information without patient inf um, consent. Another issue is that the patients have a right for respectful care, um, to respect the rights of the individual and not do anything that would be deleterious to that person. And the client also has a right to current information, to know what's going on and, and when and how. Again, the more a patient can participate in their care, um, the better they'll be able to, to actively improve their health status and, and prevent injury and disease. Let's talk a little bit about informed consent because, again, that's a right patients have. If they're going to be going, undergoing procedures or either diagnostic procedures or treatment procedures, they have a right to know what's going to go on and, and all the um, pieces for that. Now, when you're dealing with informed consent, the client or the person that you're dealing with must be an adult, and in most states that's age 18. Um, if the client is not an adult, then you would deal with the, um, the parent or, or guardian if the patient is incompetent. Informed consent must be voluntary. Uh, we cannot coerce patients to do what we believe to be good for them. A uh, patient has a right to refuse certain um, procedures and, and all if they don't think it's in their best interest. Um, informed consent must be, or the information regarding informed consent must be done in a way that the client can understand it. For example, um, you would not go into the room and say, because your coronary arteries have ASHD, we're going to do a cardiac cath. And some of the complications of that cardiac cath could be a systole or atopic beats. Because what you just said to the client, they probably got about every third word, which is the and and the or and the but, but not anything in between. You would explain, um, or the physician would explain to the patient in ways that they can actually understand. Um, we believe that there is blockage in your heart, and what we're going to do is go in with an instrument that allows us to look around. I mean, something that the patient can understand. Um, many times we fall into to, um, medical jargon without many times even realizing it. And I'm sure that the average person on the street doesn't know what ASHD is, arteriosclerotic heart disease. So again, the informed consent um, needs to be given to the patient or the information regarding it needs to be given to the patient in a way that they can understand. Now, a client cannot give consent if they have been medicated. For example, if the patient's going to surgery and the pre-op or preliminary medications have already been given, you cannot get consent from that patient because they are in an, what we would consider an altered state. The same is true if someone's been drinking um, or is under the influence of drugs. Again, they can't give voluntary consent because they are not um, competent to give that type of consent at that particular time. Now, informed consent, um, there are certain things that have to be involved in it or included in informed consent. First and, and the foremost that makes perfect sense is an explanation of the treatment and expected results. This is what we're going to do or this is what we want to look at for diagnostic procedures and this is what we expect to happen. You do have to include anticipated risks and possible discomforts. We're going to go in um, you know, with a liver biopsy and there will be pain at the site afterward, but you'll be given medications to cover that. Um, they also need to be told the potential benefits. If we go in and do the biopsy, we'll be able to tell how, you know, what is going on here and then make decisions from there. So again, the potential benefits. They also need to be told possible alternatives, meaning we can either biopsy the lump or we can do a CAT scan or an MRI. I mean, they need to be told exactly what their alternatives are, not that they have no choice and this must be done. And again, answers to questions. Clients um, many times have um, questions um, when they're given information that is of a crucial, you know, it's crucial to their, their well-being and health care. Um, patients have told me that they understood, again, about every third word. You know, what did you say after? I mean, that type of thing. And it, it's helpful in, in a, obtaining conform, or informed consent that you ask the client to kind of say back to you what, you know, what 
did I, what did you get from this? Or tell me what you understand is going to happen or, you know, that type of thing. Again, that's very helpful. And an important issue that you need to remember, and it may be tested on the NCLEX, is that consent can be withdrawn at any time. If the patient has given consent for surgery and the patient's been pre-medicated and they're just about to wheel them out of the room, off to the surgery suite, that patient still has the right to withdraw that consent. That they can say, no, I've thought it over and you know I really don't want to do this. And in that case, the nurse would stop and contact the physician. But again, the patient has the right in, in getting informed consent, the patient needs to know that, yes, we've gotten your consent, but again, you have the right to withdraw it at any time if you reconsider. Informed consent, who gets it? Again, this is an important point. The physician obtains the informed consent. It is their responsibility, both their right and their responsibility to get it from the patient. So the physician is the one actually talking with the patient and giving the expected benefits and giving the possible alternatives and giving all the information that I just talked about. Um, again, many times the nurse will be in the room when this is going on, so the nurse can, you know, fill in the blanks or answer questions or confirm or, you know, um, patient may say, well, did he say, you know, that they're going to go in with a tube and, and empty this particular thing? Yes, that is, you know, what the physician said. So it is helpful to be party to this, but it is the physician's responsibility. So you might say, well, what is the nurse's responsibility? Well, the nurse's responsibility many times is to witness the patient's signature. And when you witness the signature, what you're saying is the consent was given voluntarily. The patient was not coerced into signing the form. And you're saying that the client's signature is authentic, that yes, that really is Mr. Jones um, who signed it. And the other thing you're saying is that the patient was competent to give consent. They weren't medicated, they weren't... Um, hadn't been drinking, that they were in a state so that consent was voluntary um, and works. So again, nurses do not ask patients to sign informed consent. They may be party to the activity, but it is the physician's responsibility to ask for, ask that consent be um, given. And one of the questions you might see on the NCLEX exam is um, the nurse is in a situation where she or he doesn't believe the patient understands the risks and benefits. What should the nurse do? Well, in that case, that um, should be reported to the physician, and the physician should come back and talk with the patient again. Um, so again, you know, just kind of remember what the nurse's responsibility is with regard to informed consent. Again, it's a topic that is um, somewhat frequently tested on the NCLEX exam. Let's talk a little bit more about the patient bill of rights. We talked about um, the fact that they have the right to know what's going to happen to them. Um, they also have the right to refuse treatment. Um, and that's something, it can be done several ways. Um, one would be that, no, I won't sign the informed consent for this particular procedure. But there are other ways, uh, more formalized and stylized way, that patients can refuse treatment. Uh, one is with the use of an um, advanced directive. And again, kind of a little aside here, everyone should have advanced directives or a living will or have a health care um, designated as a surrogate if they become um, incompetent or incapacitated. Now, advanced directives are based on the Patient Self-Determination Act, which is a federal law. The federal law states that um, facilities, healthcare facilities, must provide written information about patients' rights to make healthcare decisions. So all patients going into a healthcare facility will get to this in, in a written form. Now, there are different types of advanced directives. One is a living will. Um, a living will is a legal document. Um, in this particular document, the client states what they do and do not want done for them if they become incapacitated or if something occurs. For example, um, and there, many times there's certain things listed, CPR, dialysis, tube feedings, um, being hooked up to a respirator, and the client can say, yes, I want this, or no, I don't want this. So there's, it isn't a, a blanket where I want everything done for me or I want nothing done for me. You can pick and choose, if you will, um, the particular things you want done if you um, are incapacitated. Another part of the living will is you will designate someone who will make health care decisions for you in your stead if, if you are unable to do that. Another uh, way of, um, another type of, of advanced directive is a durable power of attorney. Again, this is a legal document where the client legally or appoints someone to be their healthcare surrogate or, or the person who will make healthcare decisions for them in the event that they become incapacitated. So again, these are ways that a client can 
um, refuse treatment or, or designate the type of treatment they want done for them. Now let's talk just a minute about what, um, we've talked about some of the things they can and can't do or you can determine what you want. There is such a thing as aggressive um, type of treatment and aggressive treatment would be do everything, um, intubation, CPR, you know, all the different type of emergency activities that would be used to sustain life. A client may decide that they don't want all aggressive um, treatments or, or what the word they may times use is extraordinary measures. Um, someone may determine that um, they you know, have lived a, a good full life and they don't want extraordinary measures used to sustain that life if some, something happens with their physiological processes. So again, these are the type of, um, the patient has a right to this type of information. A patient has a right to make these type of choices. Um, and again, it's very helpful to have these in place before you become incapacitated so that the events you do, um, you have someone who will be your surrogate, someone who you trust will be able to make decisions for you. Other parts of the patient bill of rights, the patient has a, a right to a reasonable uh, response to a request for services. What that means is if I put on my call light, I have a reasonable expectation that someone in a reasonable amount of time will come in and help me or, or answer my call light and, and provide me with assistance. Um, so timely care is something that is a right for patients. Again, a, a right um, under the Patient Bill of Rights is that the patients have the right to know hospital or clinic regulations. Um, the best way to do this is to provide a good orientation when the patient first enters that particular healthcare system. So again, um, that is a right that patients have. Patients also have a right to be free from both chemical and physical restraints. Um, restraints are, is a topic that um, is frequently tested on the NCLEX exam and it's important that you understand the patient's right to be free from this type of um, restraints, both chemical and physical, but also what the nurse's responsibilities are with regard uh, to restraints. There are different type of restraints. There is a vest restraint that goes across the, the midsection of a patient. It usually is used to restrain a patient in a bed or a chair and attaches to the bed frame. The bed frame, not the side rail. So it needs to be um, applied appropriately. Another type of restraint is a belt restraint. This again is used to secure the client to the bed. And you need to be careful not to put, place it too tightly across the, abdomen, the client's abdomen or chest. Again, you don't want to impede circulation. You want to impede gross movement, but, but not circulation. Another type of restraint is a mitten restraint. Um, many times these are used to um, make it so the patient cannot pull out IV lines or, or tube feedings or, or that type of thing, and G-tubes. So um, if you have mittens on, you can't grab anything. You, you just have, um, you know, soft pads. Um, so again, that, that is a type of restraint. Um, there's an elbow restraint. Many times they will use these with children where the elbow will be restrained so they cannot um, get to their mouth or, or to their nose. It, they can move their arms around, but they cannot bend the elbow. It prevents the flexion of the elbow. So that's another type of restraint. Uh, the most restrictive type of restraint is what we call a mummy restraint, and that's used um, for short periods of time, not extended periods of time, um, when children are undergoing healthcare procedures. And actually they will wrap the child like a mummy so the child cannot move anything, and, and many times there's a, a place where their head goes and they cannot move that. Again, important to stay absolutely with the child at all times when they are restrained this way, and it's used for short periods of time during healthcare procedures. Now, dealing with restraints, one of the most important um, concepts I want you to think about is that it is crucially important to consider alternative methods to keep the patient safe. Now, restraints are used not for discipline. They're not used for nurse convenience. They are used for safety. And again, that's a very important concept. Uh, we don't do it because we can't watch the patient all the time or we can't you know, be there, that type of thing. Um, that would be for the nurse's convenience. We want to do it only in certain situations where we do it to keep the patient safe. Um, so alternatives, you might say, well, okay, what, what are the alternatives? Well, it might be that we orient the client frequently to time, place, and person. Because if, if they're disoriented, they're much more likely to get out of bed and engage in activities that we don't want them to. Um, many hospitals use a sitter type of arrangement where someone comes and actually sits with the patient and um, may engage them in conversation, may not, may be there just as kind of a, a watcher, if you will, to make sure if the patient begins to move around or attempt to get out of bed, the, the sitter could intervene or, or call the nurse. 
patients that are confused and, and uh, likely to need some type of, of help keeping their environment safe, you don't want this patient way down the hall, far from the nurse's station. You want them up by the nurse's station so every time you walk by the desk or walk to and from the treatment room, you can glance in the room and take a look at the patient. And again, all medications should be evaluated for therapeutic, effect, therapeutic effects and side effects. It's not infrequent that if you're reading through uh, side effects of medications that confusion is a side effect. So it might be that your patient is confused because of something you're giving him. Yes, it has a therapeutic response, but there's also the side effect of confusion. And maybe there's a, a certain or other medication that doesn't have that particular side effect that you could use. And one of the things that, again, I, I mentioned it just briefly in passing, the fact that clients have a right to be free from both chemical and physical restraints. Up to now, I've talked about the type of physical restraints that you might, you know, the elbow restraints and the mummy restraints, but there is such a thing as a chemical restraint where you um, would use psychotropic drugs to control the behavior of a client. That is inappropriate. Again, a client has a right not to be controlled in that particular way. So again, restraints, important topic for the NCLEX exam. Um, some of the ways you might be asked questions, it might be that you are asked to assess the, the need of a client for restraints. It might be that they um, want you to consider or identify less restrictive methods of keeping the patient safe. Uh, it might be that you're asked to, you're given a situation and you're asked, um, is the use of restraints appropriate or are they being used in an appropriate manner? For example, you have a patient that's um, an elderly patient, a little bit confused, and there's an overbed table in front of them on their wheelchair that um, provides a place for them to do activities, but also uh, limits their ability to, to get up and, and, and walk around and, and perhaps fall. So again, alternative to restraints is very important for you to consider uh, in keeping patients safe. It might be that there's visual or auditory stimuli that you use, you know, talking with the patient, we talked about orienting them frequently. Relaxation techniques may be used. Um, and again, many times, especially with the elderly, when you find that they're getting up and getting out of bed, is to go to the bathroom. So if you toilet the, the patient on a Q2 hour basis, they won't be getting up on their own because they will have a regular routine and they won't feel the need to get up out of their wheelchair and, and perhaps fall. Okay, well, so, th so we've considered alternative restraints, um, but there wasn't an alternative that kept the patient safe. So the physician did write an order for a patient restraints. And again, it's important for you to remember that a physician's order is required for the use of restraints, and that order is only good for 24 hours. Uh, you can't write an order and, and a week later, you know, um, be operating on that same order. That order has to be renewed every 24 hours. And before it's renewed, it would never be automatic. Um, even before the restraints were used, the nurse would assess the need for restraints and document that. Uh, before the order was um, reapplied or, or renewed, the nurse would reassess for the continued use of restraints and document the fact that, yes, continued use of restraints is appropriate. Um, the doctor can't write an order if the patient needs restraining, restrain them. It cannot be a PRN order. Um, and you all are probably young enough not to know the days when, when that was written. The physician would, um, for many elderly patients, say, you know, restraints PRN and leave it to the nurse's discretion. Um, that, again, violates the patient's rights to be free from both chemical and physical restraints. Now, when restraints are used, you want to monitor the patient very carefully, very closely, and very frequently just to make sure that they continue to be safe, that they haven't moved around and now the, the, res the chest restraint that was fine a few minutes ago, they've maneuvered themselves in such a situation that now it's binding and uh, decreasing their respiratory excursion. So again, the reassessment um, and redocumentation of the need for restraints is very important. When restraints are used, they need to be removed, good skin care, good range of motion, and then reapplied. So you would not put the restraints on um, for, at 7 o'clock and then come back at 3 o'clock and, you know, reassess the patient. Um, during that time, you know, you need to meet the patient's needs for circulation, uh, good skin care, uh, range of motion. And again, one of the things that we didn't talk about with this particular thing yet, but is informed consent. Um, it, you cannot use restraints without either the patient's or the family's consent. They need to know the where's and the why's and the how's and, and why it's being requested, and they need to give consent. Again, it, it goes with patient rights. 
Okay, so we've talked about patient rights um, and we've talked about the nurse being an advocate and let's talk a little bit more about um, nurse advocacy. To advocate is to speak for another. Um, nurses are responsible for being patient advocates and in many cases it really is just providing them or making sure that they receive the rights that they're entitled to. So nurses are responsible for supporting client rights. Um, another form of advocacy or another way that advo advocacy is completed is that um, the nurse communicates with other members of the interdisciplinary team. Uh, communication is paramount. Um, everyone needs to know what's going on, whether it's OT, occupational therapy, physical therapy, you know, all the members, you know, social services need to go know what's going on because in that way the nurse can advocate for the client and make sure that things are happening so that the patient gets good care. And again, providing the patient with information um, to help them meet their needs and, and the different options available to them and problem solving and, and working with patients, again, is, is quite important. And again, with advocacy, don't forget about documentation, um, you know, what's going on and the type of things happening. Very important to document that so that, again, documentation is a form of communication. So you need to communicate with the dis interdisciplinary team both verbally and in writing. The next topic we're going to talk about is legal issues. Now, when talking about legal issues, there are unintentional wrongs and intentional wrongs. Let me say that again. There are unintentional wrongs and intentional wrongs. We're going to talk first about unintentional wrongs. This is like, Mom, I didn't mean to do it. You know, I, it, I didn't do it on purpose. The first unintentional wrong we're going to talk about is negligence. Negligence is the unintentional failure of a person to perform an act that a reasonable person would or would not do in a similar circumstance. Let me say that again. Negligence is the unintentional failure of a person to perform an act that a reasonable person would or would not do in a similar circumstance. And the important thing with negligence is to remember is that it may be omission, meaning you do something, or uh, which means you don't do something, or commission where you actually do something. So it's either doing something or failure to do something. For example, giving um, medication to the wrong patient is negligence. Uh, giving medication to a patient that's allergic to that medication, um, again, negligence. Failing to check the pulse of a person or a, a client before giving digoxin, that would be negligence. So how do you avoid negligence? Well, one is um, you want to follow standards of care. You have to know the standards of care and then follow them closely. Again, giving good, competent nursing care will keep you out of um, performing unintentional wrongs such as negligence. Communication, again, goes a long way toward making sure that everyone is on the same page and knows what's going on so that um, unintentional errors don't happen. Again, documentation. You want to document fully and you want to document in a timely manner so that, again, information can be shared. And again, developing rapport with both clients and their families very, very important. Again, clients are, will be more likely to participate in their own care and, and health make their health care decisions and, and you're less likely um, to um, get involved in negligence. The second um, unintentional wrong is malpractice. Uh, malpractice is professional negligence that involves misconduct or lack of skill in carrying out professional responsibilities. Again, let me say that again. Malpractice is professional negligence involving misconduct or lack of skill in carrying out professional responsibilities. Um, in this case, this is where nursing care falls below the standards of care. Now, there are required elements for malpractice, and malpractice is a legal term. For example, uh, duty. The nurse owes a duty to the patient. So the nurse, the defendant, owes a duty to the client who is the plaintiff. Second uh, required element for malpractice is breach of duty. Uh, the nurse did not carry out the duty. The nurse failed to do something. The third required element for malpractice is injury. Um, the client was injured. If there's no injury, there's no malpractice. And the last required element for malpractice is causation. It has to be that the nurse's failure to carry out the duty caused the injury. There has to be direct causation. If it, there wasn't direct causation, again, there can be no malpractice. So a couple of examples of malpractice, um, a medication that causes injury. Um, the patient has an untoward effect um, or, or they were given a medication they were allergic to and had an anaphylactic reaction. Another example would be in, um, the patient's having IV therapy and because the nurse 
fail to, to use um, consistent care with caring for that IV. The IV infiltrated, there was a phlebitis and sloughing of skin. Um, falls, again, a good example of malpractice where the nurse failed to do what was needed to be done to keep the patient safe. For example, raise the side rails after giving medication. Uh, failure to use a septic technique, again, could be considered malpractice or failure to adequately monitor changes in the client's condition. Again, malpractice. You can see it's professional negligence um, involving professional responsibilities. Okay, so those are the unintentional wrongs. Let's now talk about the intentional wrongs. The first intentional wrong, wrong is assault. And you might say, well, heck, I'm not going to go around beating up my patients. Well, uh, let's talk about assault. Assault is any intentional threat to bring about harm or offensive contact. Again, assault is any intentional threat to bring about harm or offensive contact. It could be that if you would say to a patient, if you don't stay in that bed, I'm going to tie you down. That is assault. Or if you uh, don't stop you know, putting the call light on, I'm going to give you a shot. Again, that is assault. So um, it's an, an intentional threat um, for the patient. The second intentional wrong is battery. Um, this includes any intentional touching without consent. Um, and again, in this case, it can either be harmful and cause injury or be merely offensive. So again, battery, any intentional touching of the patient without the patient's consent can cause harm or can just merely be offensive. But it is a legal issue and it is an intentional wrong. The last intentional wrong is probably the one that happens most often, and that's invasion of privacy. This is release of information without the client's consent. Remember we talked about confidentiality. Um, the client is, has a right to confidential care, um, and if that is broken or breached, then that is an intentional wrong and is a legal issue. When you talk about legal issues, there's two um, kind of overriding or, or big concepts you need to talk about. The first is the Nurse Practice Act. The Nurse Practice Act, um, every state has one. Um, you should know yours in the state that you're practicing in. And it is the state law that defines what is reasonable care in that state. And there are some variations from state to state. So if you move around, you'll want to uh, plug back into and find out what the Nurse Practice Act is in the state where you move. Again, it defines what a reasonable nurse would do in a situation in that particular state. The second kind of um, big concern or, or overriding issue we want to talk about is the Good Samaritan Law. Now, not every state has those, and again, you should know whether or not the state that you are currently in or going to has Good Samaritan Laws. What this does is it limits the liability of professionals who give care or render care in an emergency situation. If you're driving along the highway and you come across a, a multiple vehicle auto accident and there's someone lying on the road and you give care, uh, what will happen is if that state has a Good Samaritan law, um, you will not be held liable for giving care if, and this is the big if, your actions are reasonable um, when compared to what the standards of care would be in that particular state. So if you give poor care and when your actions are compared to what a reasonable nurse would do in, in a similar or the same situation, then the Good Samaritan Law will not help you because you have, have breached standards of care. So again, with Good Samaritan Laws, your, your actions are compared to what a reasonable person, professional person would do in the same situation. Again, they vary by state. Important for you to know what happens in your state. Okay, let's go on to the next topic. This is management of care. Management of care um, is an overriding uh, concept with healthcare today, and it is a topic that is frequently tested on the NCLEX exam. Let's talk about first case management. Um, and we participate in case management. Many times I think we, we need to kind of step back and kind of refresh or review what the issues are or why are we doing things in this particular way. First of all, the goal of case management is to maintain wellness. Um, that is where we, uh, that is, that's the goal. And the focus of case management is on client outcomes. Not what we do, but how the patient responds or what the patient does. And case management very much uses an interdisciplinary approach. It isn't what the nurse is doing or the nurse and the physician in concert are doing. It's what the whole interdisciplinary team is doing with the patient. And it does involve continuous quality improvement, um, quality assurance, any of the issues or, or whatever words you want to use to describe those issues. Now case management, what it does is it identifies, coordinates, monitors, 
implementation of services needed to achieve desired outcomes in a specific amount of time. Let me say that again. Case ma management identifies, coordinates, and monitors implementation of services needed to achieve desired outcomes in a specified or specific amount of time. Now let's talk a minute about the benefits of case management. Uh, when case management is used in a managed care situation, it reduces complications. It reduces the cost, and, and we all understand that healthcare is a, a bottom line business. Um, case management increases collaboration and increases consistency. So there's consistency of care, and it actually has been shown to improve the quality of care. So with case management, one of the major concepts of case management is they use critical pathways. And it's important that you understand this concept. Critical pathway is where, um, depending on the medical diagnosis, it is um, determined what the expected length of stay is. Um, patient identification data is involved with critical pathways. Um, the time frame um, is identified. The clinical outcome of, or what expe is expected for the patient to do, again, is identified. Um, the patient outcomes, both the clinical outcome and the patient outcome, what's going on in the clinical setting, and also how the patient is responding. So for example, you have a patient who comes in with a fractured hip. It's an elderly uh, woman, 80 years old, uh, fell and broke her, her right hip. So that's the medical diagnosis. Um, they would then look at the uh, critical pathway and know that most patients having this diagnosis stay in the hospital for let's say four days and then are uh, transferred to a rehabilitation facility for a period of two weeks. Again, these are examples I'm giving you. Nothing, you know, don't, don't write that down any place. Um, again, that, that's the time frame. Um, there's certain things that are involved, um, the type of medications, the type of services that are provided to the patient given the diagnosis. And again, you can see where the clinical pathway or, or the critical pathway for a fractured hip would be very different than a 45-year-old man comes into the emergency room presenting with symptoms of a myocardial infarction. In that situation, very different treatments would be um, involved, time frame would be very different, clinical outcomes would be very different, patient outcomes would be very different. So again, you know, it depends on the medical diagnoses and, and what stems from that. Well, we know that not all patients, not everything goes according to plan. Uh, sometimes things happen. Uh, for example, the 80-year-old woman that we talked about uh, who fell and broke her hip and is, has a critical pathway for that may develop pneumonia. Well, then that changes um, the care that's going to be provided to her, the outcomes that we're looking for. So in that case, that's what is known as a variance. A variance is where there is a change in the established plan that involves more, less, or different services to the patients to achieve outcomes. Again, let me say that again. Variances are a change in the established plan that includes more, less, or different services to patient to receive or achieve the desired outcome. Um, you know, again, the, the patient with a fractured hip that develops pneumonia, uh, the patient um, in with congestive heart failure that goes into severe pulmonary edema, the patient in with a fractured femur who develops pulmonary emboli or a fat embolism. Um, you can see where um, the, there's a variance or a change in what's going to happen with that patient uh, based on critical pathways. Okay, and who's delivering this care? Let's talk about the nursing staff and, and who's actually delivering care to patients. Um, the nursing staff, there are different levels of staffing um, in hospitals, and we're all aware of that. Um, the nursing staffs are what we call multi-leveled. Uh, first of all, there's RNs or registered nurses. They are responsible for managing nursing personnel, managing the nursing personnel that actually provide care to a group of clients or a group of patients. Um, the nurse is accountable for the care given to the patient. The nurse should be able to explain the action and, and the results of, of what's going on in patients either under his or her care. The second level of staff is an LPN, licensed practical nurse, or LVN, licensed vocational nurse. Um, these, this type of um, health care personnel has usually one year of education and training. An LPN or an LVN assists with the implementation of a defined plan of care. 
Okay, let me say that again. That's an important concept. An LPN or LVN assists with the implementation of a defined plan of care. LPNs can differentiate normal from abnormal, but, and again, this important concept, they care for physiologically stable patients with predictable conditions. Let me say that again. LPNs should be assigned and should care for patients with, that are physiologically stable with predictable conditions. Um, LPNs have knowledge of asepsis and dressing changes. Um, depending on the Nurse Practice Act in that state, they may or may not be able to pass medications. So that's the second level of staffing um, for delivery of health care. The third level of staffing, again, we're, we're kind of going down in, in level of, of knowledge and, and expertise. This is UAP, Unlicensed Assistive Personnel. UAPs help with direct patient care. This may be bathing, transferring, feeding. Again, usually it involves direct patient um, activities. UAPs have minimal um, formal education. There isn't a program usually um, that is in place to uh, train or educate these particular uh, group of, of personnel. This includes nurses' aides, although nurses' aides can be certified, but nursing assistants, nursing technicians, orderlies. In some places, they call them nurse extenders. Again, um, a minimal educational background in most cases. And again, they are, um, their responsibility is to provide direct patient care under the supervision, many times, of a, a RN or LPN. Okay, so we know the who, now let's talk about the what. Let's talk about assignment and delegation. When you're thinking about assignment, you have to consider the differences between accountability and responsibility. Now with accountability, you accept ownership of what you're doing and you are able to explain your actions and the results of that action. So that's accountability, I'm accountable for my actions. The other part is responsibility, which is the obligation to perform the task, and you can see where responsibility, which is an obligation to perform a task, and accountability, where I accept ownership of the results and all, are, are two different issues. Now, when the RN makes assignments or makes an assignment, she or he transfers both responsibility and accountability. And, and that's important. Again, when the nurse makes an assignment, there's a transfer of both accountability and responsibility. But because of the accountability issue, there are some issues that the nurse cannot assign to a LPN or LVN or a UAP. The nurse would have to assign that particular um, issue to an RN because, um, because of the issue of the accountability. You can give the responsibility for the task away but not the accountability that goes with it. And we're going to talk about some of those issues. Um, for example, a nurse cannot um, give away the accountability or cannot um, assign issues or, or actions that require assessment because again only the nurse is um, able because of, of education and training to perform the assessment needed. Uh, teaching is the same issue. The nurse cannot assign teaching to other members of the healthcare team except for another nurse or making nursing judgments. Again those are the prerogative or the purview only of the registered nurse. So again when you're dealing with assignments or thinking about assignments Accountability, which is the ownership of, um, and you're able to explain the results and, and actions, versus responsibility, which is the obligation to perform the task. So with assignment, um, you're allocating to health care team members um, required care for patients. And the, the steps you would go through doing the actual assignment, first of all, you would need to determine the care needed to meet the patient needs. And when you're doing that, the type of things you should be thinking about, you need to take into consideration the time required. Uh, you need to take into consideration the complexity of the activities. Um, the acuity of the patients will make a difference. And there are infection control issues. And when making assignments, um, you need to take into consideration the knowledge and abilities of the, of the individuals or the personnel that you are assigning to, because there are different levels of, of abilities, even with people with the same uh, type of um, educational or credentials. You also have to take into account continuity of care. Um, if you've ever been in a situation where you're in a hospital and every day a new nurse shows up um, and you have to kind of break them in again, that, that gets difficult. Again, one of the things we need to 
think about, though, when we're talking about um, both assignment and delegation is the fact that NCLEX is what we call ivory tower nursing. That means you have all the personnel you need um, to give excellent care to all of your patients all of the time. You have all the equipment you need. Um, if you're going to immerse a body part in hot water, you're going to have a bath thermometer. If you're going to move a patient up in bed um, and it requires four people to do a lift, you have four people. Um, the answers to NCLEX questions, um, and this is both for assignment and delegating, but also all the other issues um, you will find in textbooks, meaning it's what um, authors say should be done, what Potter and Perry would recommend you do in a particular situation, or what Ignavaticus would do in a particular situation. Now, when you're giving assignments, um, you need to describe them in measurable terms. Um, you need to be specific about the expected results. Um, and again, it, it's best to assign patients, not just particular tasks. So let's talk about delegation. Now with delegation, the responsibility and, and the authority for the task is transferred to another, but not the accountability, not the ownership of, of it. So that's different. Um, the responsibility, again, we said was the obligation to accomplish the task. For example, to do vital signs for a, um, a team would be you can assign or delegate that responsibility to a particular person. When we talk about accountability, that's where the person accepts ownerships for the results. And the accountability really remains with the nurse, although it can be shared. But it cannot be delegated to an LPN or an unlicensed assistive personnel. Again, assignments and delegation are important topics on the NCLEX. Um, so it's, it's important that you know, you know what can and cannot be done. Um, another important concept is you can only delegate those tasks for which you are responsible. If it's not under your area um, that, of responsibility, you cannot delegate it to somebody else. So when thinking about delegation, there are six rights. Um, the right task, uh, the right person, and that means the person that has the knowledge, skills, and abilities to perform it in the way that it should be performed. Uh, the right time. Uh, and this means you would never delegate in a crisis. It would have to be a, a stable situation. Uh, the right information, you would need to share the right information with the person that you are delegating to. Uh, the right supervision, again, remember we talked about the accountability issue. You can't give that away, so you need to maintain supervision of the person you, to who you have delegated. Um, to find out is the task or, or is the activity being performed correctly. And also the right follow-up. Um, the right follow-up might be written information, um, it probably would be, might also be verbal communication um, with the nurse, again, as, as a follow-up. So again, when you're dealing with delegation um, and assignment, the nurse has to have clearly defined goals. Um, you need to work with the competencies of the staff, again, determining what is appropriate to assign, what is appropriate to delegate. Um, Communication is paramount with, again, assignment and delegation. Um, you need to communicate very clearly what should be done, what the outcome is expected to be, um, what monitoring is going to go on, what the timeline is, um, any deviations that you would expect, again, what to do if there are deviations. For example, if I'm delegating to a um, LPN the fact that I want the patient who is recovering uh, from a hip fracture uh, to walk in the hall then, or you know, recovering from another injury to walk in the hall, what I would not say is walk Mrs. Smith and let me know how it goes. What I would say is walk Mrs. Smith 40 feet down the hall, make sure that she has good shoes on, um, have her hold on to the handrail in the hall. If she becomes weak or short of breath, stop. If it continues, have her sit down. Um, and then come back and let me know how it goes. So again, you've given very specific information to the person, not just an open kind of general where they have to fill in the blanks themselves. There's some things that you do not delegate. Uh, you do not delegate total control, again, because of the accountability issue. You do not delegate discipline issues. You do not delegate confidential tasks, again, because that needs to be the responsibility of the registered nurse. Uh, you do not delegate highly technical tasks. You do not delegate controversial tasks, and you do not delegate during a crisis. Again, issues during a crisis must be handled by the registered nurse because she or he has the knowledge and the background to handle those situations. And again, 
delegation and assignments are frequently tested topics on the Young Clock Senate. Many times what they will say to you, they will give you a situation and ask you whether the delegation was appropriate. So there's several things you need to consider. For example, um, given the situation, is there a potential for harm? Um, how complex is the care that you're delegating? Uh, do you anticipate that problem solving will be required? And if there is a, something where you're, you're thinking of delegating that and you know that it requires problem solving, again, that probably is the purview of the registered nurse because that, that particular level of personnel has the background and the knowledge and, and abilities to, to engage in that type of higher level thinking. Um, how predictable is the outcome? Again, remember we talked about the LPN or LVN? They deal with stable patients with predictable outcomes. So again, if you're delegating and, and you know it's a stable situation, you know it has a predictable outcome, then in, in all likelihood that is, that's a good thing to delegate. Um, what level of interaction is required for the client? You know, how interactive is this experience? And again, if um, things that we never delegate, we never delegate teaching, we never delegate assessment. Um, those are things that, again, only the nurse can do because of the background and education that they have. Okay, we're going to go on to a, another topic, a similar topic. We're going to talk a little bit about critical thinking. Um, critical thinking involves creativity, problem solving, and decision making. It's kind of everything all wrapped up together. With critical thinking, the nurse needs to decide what is important. The nurse will validate and organize data. So you might say, well, well what does that mean or what, what basis, you know, why do I need to know that? Well, on the NCLEX exam, you're going to be giving a, given a situation and asked, what should the nurse do? Well, it's not going to be something where you say, okay, I know the nurse should do it, and you're going to look over at the answers and say, there it is. I can see it. I can recognize it. Because that's not a question that will be on the NCLEX because they don't ask knowledge-based questions. They ask questions that require critical thinking, that require problem solving and decision making that require you to kind of organize and, and validate things. And again, you might say, well, wow, that's really going to be hard. Well, these are the very same steps that you engage in when you care for the patient at the bedside. The only difference is location. You're not at the bedside. You're going to be sitting in a chair in a testing center. Um, and again, you make many of these same decisions every day when you care for patients. Well, what we need you to do is to transfer that ability or that skill set to your answering questions on the NCLEX exam. Again, remember we talked about what nursing is and, and nurses need to anticipate problems. Um, you don't want to wait for symptoms. You want to anticipate and, and prevent issues and, and promote wellness with clients. Other things with critical thinking, again, this is a very important concept. You should look for patterns and relationships. Uh, what's going on? What does this particular information have to do with that? Again, if you look for patterns, that will help you with your critical thinking. Um, another way, when you think of critical thinking, it's where you actually transfer knowledge from one situation to another. Um, you're in a new situation, but you kind of know what to do because you've been in a similar one before, and you know that if I do a certain thing here, chances are good this is what the outcome will be. Um, and again, you know what standards of care are. You know what should happen in a particular situation. Uh, you know how to figure out what's going on um, and again, evaluate according to established criteria. Again, that's the type of critical thinking that's imperative that you engage in while you're answering questions on the NCLEX. Again, this isn't foreign to you. Um, the only pro or issue that's different is you usually engage or you always engage in this activity when you're at the bedside we're now asking you to engage in similar activities when you're answering test questions. Okay, we'll kind of change gears a little bit here and we will talk about the next topic, which is organ donation. With organ donation, um, the person, the individual themselves, or the family members can give consent. In many states, there's some, uh, a form on the back of the driver's license that people can complete and get witnessed, um, so they say that they're willing to engage in organ donation. Um, it is the nurse's responsibility many times to discuss or to ask about this with um, clients either that are in um, serious situations or the, many times the client's family. And if the client is um, terminal or, or has died, again, the type of um, request for organ donation can happen during the same type of talks with um, 
uh, death-related topics, such as what funeral home are you going to use, um, if there's going to be a request for an autopsy, you know, that type of thing. Again, it, it fits in very well with that. Okay, one of the topics very important to the NCLEX, again, is documentation. Well, the good news is they're not going to ask you to write nurse's notes, but they are going to ask questions that uh, evaluate your ability to communicate in a legal form. And again, that's what documentation is, is communicating in a legal form. Um, documentation is anything written or printed where you actually, you know, write something down. And one of the things you need to remember is that it's a record or a proof of, of what took place. Um, documentation, again, is one of your best forms of communication, and it does help maintain or does maintain the legal record. So let's talk about what some of the characteristics of good documentation is. Well, first of all, it has to be legible. Um, if it can't be read, um, you don't, no one knows what it is you're actually talking about. So it has to be legible. It has to be accurate and factual. What that means is you don't give summary data, you don't give judgments about things, you give the facts, you know, nothing but the facts. Um, so rather than saying patient's vital signs are stable, you will give vital signs. Um, and the person reading that particular entry can go back to the entry before and see that the vital signs have not changed. If you give me the summary data that, they, that they're stable, um, I don't know what they are, so if they would change, I have nothing to base this, uh, do a comparison with. Again, good documentation is timely. That means it takes place after a particular thing has taken place and within a short period of time after. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're saying, well, uh, you know, if hospitals are very busy places. I can't imagine that you want me to stop what I'm doing and caring for all these patients and meeting their needs and, and go right in a chart. Well, Remember, this is um, ivory tower nursing. On the NCLEX exam, you don't have 24-hour days. You have 48-hour days, and you have lots of time to stop what you're doing and go right in the chart and then come back and give excellent care to all the patients under, you know, that you are responsible for. So again, good documentation is timely or current. Good documentation is thorough or complete. Now, that doesn't mean lengthy. They don't want you to write a tome about, you know, whatever it is going on you know, concise to the point, but thorough, covers all the um, areas that are important. Well-organized, concise, and confidential. Again, we talked about confidentiality. Um, the chart um, is confidential information that be, should be shared with people only who have responsibility for caring for a particular patient at that time. For example, in the NCLEX, the question might be that a nurse from another floor comes down to your floor and wants to know how her neighbor is doing or her brother-in-law is doing who's under your care. Again, because of confidentiality, you cannot share information with that nurse, even though she or he is a nurse from the same hospital. Um, can't do it. That would break confidentiality. So documentation is very important, and some of the things that we routinely document might be vital signs. They would be symptoms, uh, patient behaviors, patient complaints. We would document responses to treatments or procedures. And again, if, you, um, if the patient undergoes a change in condition and you've notified the family, it's very helpful to document the fact that you, the family has been notified and then what the family did or what their response was to that notification. One of the things um, when we're dealing with documentation that's um, a similar topic and that's incident reports. Um, incident reports, again, is a topic that frequently shows up on the NCLEX exam in, in some way. You'll remember that an incident report is a report of any unexpected or unplanned occurrence. And, that, and that's a pretty broad um, category, any unexpected or unplanned occurrence. Now, an incident report, uh, most hospitals have forms for them, but it is a statement of fact, not judgment. It's a statement of fact and the patient's physical response. So it talks about the condition of the patient. It's not, doesn't include judgments. It doesn't include summary. Uh, statements, um, but it, it's a statement of what happened and what the patient's response was. Now, what is included um, or why you would do an incident report w could be medication errors, um, could be that you omitted a med. The patient was supposed to have digoxin at 9 a.m. It's now 4 p.m. and the patient didn't get it. Um, that would require the completion of an incident report. It could be that the wrong med was given or the wrong dose or the wrong time or the wrong route. Any of the rights of medication use, if they are violated again, would 
should result in an incident report being completed. Um, if the patient has complications from procedures, again, you would complete an incident report. Um, for example, there's a biopsy and, and um, something untoward happened after the patient was returned to the room. Um, incorrect sponge count, where in surgery, when they're counting all their sponges, um, one's missing and they're unable to find it. Um, another incident report uh, situation would be failure to report a change in condition. Uh, the patient's condition changes significantly and the physician is not notified. Again, that would, would or should result in an incident report being completed. Now let's talk about incident reports. It is a form. We talked about the fact that you complete it. It includes facts. It includes the patient's response. Well, that's the form itself. Let's now talk about the charting that uh, surrounds the particular incident. Uh, you don't include reference to the incident report in the charting. You don't use inflammatory words such as error or inappropriate. You don't make judgmental statements in the chart. So those are the don'ts. Well, let's talk about the do's. You do chart the facts as they happened. Again, that's a statement of fact, not judgments, not summary information. You do chart the patient's response. If there was an adverse reaction, you chart what happened and you chart their follow-up status and also what was done to follow up. You do continue documenting until the patient's status returns to normal. So if, for example, um, a patient, you had two patients on a unit um, that were getting sliding scale regular insulin, and a particular patient was supposed to get four units of regular insulin, and the other patient, according to their sliding scale, was supposed to get eight. Well, something happened, and the patient who was supposed to get four got eight. You would complete an incident report, and again, you would follow up with that patient, and you would follow up in a timely manner, again, knowing that regular insulin Onset is half an hour, peak in two to four, last six to eight. Again, you would monitor the patient at those given times to monitor their status until they were back and went to their original status and, and again, were stable. So the type of things that would cause us, um, or other things that would cause us to complete an incident report would be a fall. Um, and the incident report would include the circumstances surrounding the fall, um, whether or not side rails were up, uh, whether or not there were lights on in the patient's rooms, um, what instructions you had given the patient. Uh, burns, again, would be a, a situation to complete an incident report. Uh, breaking aseptic technique, again, would cause um, an incident report to be completed. And also um, another reason to complete an incident report would be a medical legal incident. Um, and you might say, well, what's that? Well, that would be um, a client who refuses treatment. Um, or a family that voices dissatisfaction with the care given to the patient. Again, those are what they call medical legal incidents. Okay, the next topic we're going to talk about are cultural norms. Now, before we talk about different cultural norms, it's important that you as a nurse identify your own cultural beliefs and values. And because once you identify them, then you're able to separate them from those of the client. But if you don't know your own beliefs and values, um, it's hard for you to figure out other people's beliefs and values and give them competent and, and good care. Now, um, when you're talking about um, cultural norms, the issues involved, these are the values and beliefs of individuals that strongly influence their action and behaviors. First of all, we've got values. When you talk about values, these are personal preferences. They're, they're what motivates your behavior. Um, another concept are beliefs. Um, beliefs are things you hold to be true, uh, basic assumptions, um, personal convictions. Um, you use your beliefs to determine your values. Um, one of the ways you can really um, look at beliefs or really identify them is if you look at the traditions usually involved around holidays. Um, again, many times it's easy to see um, how a patient actually acts on or, or what their beliefs are and, and what their values are. Now again, cultural norms, again, culturally driven, and the NCLEX is a culturally driven test. Um, and if you went to a, a nursing school outside the United States, it's important that you understand nursing as practiced in the U.S. and as, as the culture is here. Um, the concepts of a culture, a lot of the issues involved in that are communication, both verbal and nonverbal. Uh, space, the amount of um, distance or, or space that is maintained. Uh, what type of contact is acceptable in that culture? Uh, what type of personal space? How close people get when they talk to each other? 
the social organization, again, is a, a cultural concept um, that's important for you to identify. Some places um, have nuclear families. Um, other cultures have extended families, again, as part of the culture. Uh, some cultures are female-dominated. Um, other cultures are male-dominated. Um, in a culture, you need to figure out what the importance of community or traditions are. In some cultures, they're very, very important. In other cultures, they are less important. Um, the concept of time, um, past, present, or future. Some cultures um, are past-oriented. Um, other cultures are future-oriented. If you're dealing with a patient from a culture that's past-oriented, it's hard to do preventative care because that's not where um, they are. It's, it's not what, where their belief system is. Uh, they, they don't believe they can or, or should um, get involved in things that, that are future-oriented. Again, attitudes toward health care, you know, what is and or is not acceptable. And again, eye contact. Again, these are all cultural norms. And it's helpful if you identify your own cultural beliefs and values so then you can separate them from the patient's beliefs and values. Another concept on the same uh, area is ethics. Um, when you think about ethics, these are guides to decision making. Um, you use ethics to identify or, or determine solutions to problems. And your ethics are based on your personal beliefs and your cultural values. So it, one kind of your ethics kind of flow from, from your uh, beliefs and, and values. When you think about ethics, these are principles of right and wrong or good and bad. Um, the ANA has a code of ethics. Um, it's included in your reading material. And what's important for you to know is that these are the guidelines for nursing care. This is what um, the American Nurses Association holds to be true with regard to ethics. And there are some ethical principles regarding nursing. For example, uh, one is autonomy. Uh, it is the nurse's responsibility to support a client's independence. Uh, we don't want the patient to be put in a dependent situation. We want to maintain their independence um, if at all possible. Confidentiality, again, is one of the ethical principles of nursing, and we've talked about that. Another ethical principle is non-malfeasance, which is do no harm. Okay, we're going to go on to the next topic, which is patient education. Um, this is one of the most important roles for the nurse, and again, because of that, it's a topic that's frequently tested on the NCLEX exam. The reason that we engage in patient education is to maintain and promote health and to prevent illness. It goes back to what the basic tenets are for uh, U.S. health care. Um, we want to restore health, and we want to help patients, if necessary, to cope with impaired functioning. So when we talk about patient education, let's review for just a minute um, learning. There are three different types of learning. We have cognitive learning, which is um, an intellectual behavior that requires thinking. It's what you're engaging in right now. There's effective learning, and with effective learning, um, there are expressions of feelings, attitudes, opinions, and values. Uh, there is psychomotor learning, uh, which is probably what you wish you were engaging in right now. This is where you integrate mental and muscular activity. It's actually doing something. Um, it's, it's what you, when you went to clinical, you said to your instructor, what are we going to do today? And you were talking about psychomotor, where you actually went in and, and worked with the patient and manipulated lines and equipment and that type of thing. So those are the different types of learning. Um, before you engage in patient education, it's very important to do an assessment. And the type of things you will assess is the client's expectations. Um, what do they expect or, or what do they think is going on? What are their learning needs? Um, is the patient motivated? Because to try and teach a patient without motivation um, is a, a futile experience. It will be very difficult to um, be successful. And again, to assess the client's ability to learn. They have different uh, learning styles different learning needs, and again, different levels of ability. Another issue for you to assess is the environment. Is the environment conducive to learning? Um, if you're in a particular place and, for example, they're doing um, some construction in the area and they're taking the walls down around you, I'm sure you can understand why that would not be a conducive place to engage in, uh, in teaching a patient about anything. Um, again, resources. When you teach the client, again, it's not just the client who should be involved, it should be the family, the significant others, uh, people who are participating in the patient's care. And you need to take into account, again, the fact the patient, you're not teaching them for them to do it in the hospital, you're teaching them for them to do it at home or, or in their, their other settings. 
So we've decided, we've assessed the patient, the patient um, knows what to expect, um, is strongly motivated, you have a quiet uh, room where you're actually going to do the teaching, um, the family is involved and there, so what do you do? Well, first of all, you need to set priorities and, and realistic goals. For example, if this particular patient's just been told that their HIV status is now positive, this is probably not the best time to go in and try and do teaching about um, the type of medication regime or, or different things that will go on. Um, the patient needs to, to deal with the fact um, with this news and, and um, feel and, and kind of integrate it before teaching can actually take place. So again, you need to establish priorities, what is most important and what should take place first. We talked about involving the families and the significant others. Um, Demonstration, if I were going to talk with you um, or someone you know about giving an injection and, and you and I just sat across a table and all I did was talk, that would be probably a very different outcome than if I had an array of syringes and we had an orange and, and you and I were going to actually handle the equipment and, and participate in you know, doing a demonstration and a return demonstration. Again, one is what we call active learning. And again, active learning is much better than passive learning in most cases. So you would demonstrate, do return demonstration, uh, allow for practice. Um, you know, again, that, that's a, a, that will uh, hardwire, if you will, the learning for the patient. And again, as you go along, it's very helpful to point out the successes or the benefits for what you're hoping uh, to attain or, or get with the patient. Now there are three factors that really do influence compliance, uh, whether or not the patient will comply or, or stay with the program. The first one is duration. Um, the basic tenet here is the shorter the duration, the greater the compliance. And it kind of comes under the, uh, the idea of I can do anything for a very short period of time. You want to be on a, a strict diet, fine. Give me four hours and, and I will be on a strict diet. You ask me to be on a, a strict diet for six weeks, 10 weeks, six months, that's a little bit different. So again, the, the shorter the duration, um, the greater the compliance. Uh, a TB patient um, taking medications for six to nine months, a uh, patient with um, type 1 diabetes who's going to be getting insulin injections for the rest of their life. Um, you know, those are, again, the longer the duration, and many times they're, the more difficult the compliance. The second component that deals or influences compliance is complexity. The more complex the situation, the less the compliance. Again, I can do something that's easy, but if you're asking me to do something that requires several steps or is more complex, um, requires higher level thinking, that's, that um, may interfere with my ability to be compliant. And the third issue is the side effects. Um, if there are side effects associated with what it is you want me to do, for example, you want me to take this medication um, but I'm a 40-year-old man and it's going to make me impotent, um, again, the side effects will alter my compliance with that medication regime. Um, the higher or the more the side effects, the less likely the patient is to comply with the regime. Again, it's one of the reasons why um, several patients with, um, with psych issues are non-compliant with their medication regime. They don't like the side effects. They find them difficult to live with. Okay, so we've gotten our patient back to a, a state of wellness and we're getting them ready for discharge. Um, well, one of the important tenets here is the fact that discharge planning doesn't wait until just before the patient goes home. In fact, the discharge planning starts with the first encounter with the patient. So when they're admitted, you should be looking toward, not that you want to get them in and get them out, but you should be looking toward discharge and, and how are you going to accomplish that and, and get the patient back on the road to wellness. So again, the patient's functional level needs to be assessed. The family and social supports need to be identified because the goal here is patient independence. Um, so you need to consider the patient's both strengths and weaknesses to get them back into an independent state. Other things with discharge planning, um, you need to identify environmental factors. If you are sending someone home, um, again, that little old lady that had the fractured hip who was 80 years old and she lives alone and she lives on the third floor of a building without an elevator, that's going to be a problem. So you need to identify environmental factors. It may be that um, some changes need to be made. Uh, for that particular lady, she probably needs to move or, or go someplace other where she can get in and out of her home. Um, some of the environmental changes that we do frequently, um, like with the elderly, we used raised toilet seats or bars on the tub. Um, 
put ramps in for wheelchair access. I mean, those are the type of issues. So you don't just say to someone, you're ready to go home, great, wheel them out the door, but there's no way they can get up the steps of their house or apartment um, with the wheelchair. You want to identify community agencies um, and make referrals, or the physician should make referrals as needed. Again, the goal should be mutual between you and the patient, and the plan of care should be something that both you and the patient um, work together for. Again, remember this is, you want to work as a team here with the patient. And the more they're involved, the more likely they are to be compliant with the regime. Well, this completes the management of care section for safe and effective care. Hello and welcome. I'm Judy Burkhardt, Executive Director of the Nursing Programs for Kaplan Educational Centers, and we are going to talk about the second section of Safe and Effective Care Environment, which is Safety and Infection Control. This area comprises about 5 to 11 percent of the questions you'll see on the NCLEX exam. Let's begin. We're going to talk first about inflammation. To understand the nursing care involved with infection control, you need to know how the body responds to infection, and it does it by inflammation. There are both systemic signs and local signs of inflammation. The local signs include swelling, heat, redness, pain or tenderness, and possible drainage. And the drainage may be bloody, which is red or bright or, or old blood. It may be serous or it may be purulent or pus filled. There are systemic signs of inflammation. These include fever or elevated temperature, malaise, weakness, lymph node enlargement, elevated WBCs or white blood cells. And again, remember normal is 5,000 to 10,000 um, WBCs per cubic millimeter, and also an elevated ESR or erythrocyte sedimentation rate. Any number of over 15 to 20 millimeters in an hour indicates inflammation. Let's talk about infections. Kind of there's general two um, overreaching topics with infections. Um, the first we're gonna talk about is communicable diseases. And you'll remember that these are caused by pathogenic organisms. They are transferred or transmitted by direct contact, by, contact, by droplet, uh, through contaminated articles, or through carriers. The other type of infection you need to be thinking about is what we call nosocomial infections. These are hospital-acquired infections. Um, if a patient acquires an infection in a hospital, they call it a nosocomial infection. Most often, these are caused by Staph aureus. And remember, hand washing is the primary way to prevent nosocomial infections. Let's talk about prevention and prevention of infections. First of all, balanced nutrition, you know, the four basic food groups, the food pyramid, will help prevent infection. Getting adequate rest, again, is a, a way to prevent infection. Um, all children and adults should have updated immunizations. And use of good aseptic a septic technique each and every time that the patient has a procedure done, again, will help prevent infections. One of the important or basic principles of infection control is the use of standard precautions. Now, at one time, these were called universal precautions, and many times now they're called either standard precautions or barrier precautions. This, again, is the primary strategy for prevention of no nosocomial infections. The thing to remember with standard precautions is you use them 100% of the time with 100% of your client. And dealing with standard precautions, it happens anytime there is exposure to blood, all body fluids, secretions and excretions, anytime you come in contact with non-intact skin, and anytime you come in contact with mucous membranes. And what is done with standard precautions, first and foremost, again, is hand washing good hand washing. Um, you would you could do good hand washing immediately after contact with blood or body fluids if it was an unexpected occurrence where you didn't have gloves on. Um, if you, even when you wear gloves, you wash your hands as soon as the gloves are removed. You wash your hands in between patient contacts and you wash your hands when you're dealing with the same patient but in between specific procedures or tasks with the very same patient. Another component of standard precautions is the use of gloves. You use non-sterile clean gloves whenever you touch blood or body fluids. Um, you would put gloves on before you come in contact with non-intact skin. You would change gloves between procedures or tasks. And once you have completed a task, you remove gloves properly, pulling them from the outside, covering them over and down, and dispose of them properly. 
Another component of standard precautions is masks, eye protection, and a face shield. You would use these type of, or this type of equipment anytime there is a chance of sprays or splashes. Again, these can't always be predicted, but you know in some cases if you're dealing with tubes and all and there's a chance of a spray, you should use the masks, eye protection, or face shield. And the last component of standard precaution is gowns. You will use gowns again when there's a chance of spraying or soiling splashes going on. Again, if the gown gets soiled, you would remove it promptly and dispose of it properly before leaving the patient's rooms. Another component of standard precautions or barrier precautions is appropriate handling of needles. You never recap a needle. You never bend or break a needle. They are always put in biohazard containers and there should be a biohazard container in the patient's room or in every patient care treatment area. If the container gets full, again, it should be disposed of properly. Um, they're never empty. They are taken off the wall and a new one reapplied. Now, some of the other issues with regard to standard precautions, first of all, is patient placement. This is a topic that is frequently tested on the NCLEX exam. You would put a patient in a private room if the patient has poor hygiene practices um, and they contaminate the environment or if the patient cannot assist in maintaining infection control precautions. For example, an infant or a child who is unable to comply with certain regulations or if you have an adult that has an altered mental status. Again, the uh, patient placement in a private room should be done. Another issue with regard to place patient placement is what we call cohorting. Cohorting is where they share a room, where you, ha you assign a patient um, to be in bed one of a two-bed room. And when you cohort patients or you assign them to particular rooms, you need to take into account the epidemiology of, of the disease process and the mode of transmission. Uh, for example, you would never put people in a room that have different infecting organisms because what you'd end up with is two people that have two diseases rather than one person with one disease each. So again, that's an important consideration. You take a look at the epidemiology and the mode of transmission before you would cohort a particular patient. Another issue with regard to standard precautions is transporting clients. Um, whenever a client with an infection is transported, you would use barrier precautions or have the patient or client use barrier precautions. These may be masks if it's droplet spray. For example, if you're moving a patient um, with tuberculosis, again, they would wear a mask as they go from place to place. Um, if you have a patient with a draining wound, you would put an impervious dressing, something that could not leak out and contaminate the environment. Now, if you're transporting clients with infections, it's very important that you notify um, the place you're going to to expect the client so they can have things ready for you and let them know what precautions are needed. Are they going to have to go into a private area? Are they going to need to be screened from other patients? Again, when the patient is being transported, you need to let the patient know what they can do to help prevent transmission of infecting organisms as they go. Um, you know, covering their mouth when they cough or, or different things such as this. And again, it's very good to involve the patient in the care if at all possible. Let's talk about some of the different type of, of transmission and uh, what the specific uh, precautions are based on the mode of transmission. The first one we're going to talk about with transmission-based precautions is airborne precautions. You would use airborne precautions anytime the transmission is airborne. Um, for example, uh, rubiola, which is measles, tuberculosis, uh, varicella, chickenpox, uh, disseminated herpes zoster or shingles. Again, all transmitted via air, the airborne route. What you would do in this case for um, airborne precautions is the patient would be put in a private room with monitored negative air pressure. You would keep the door closed because it doesn't help to have all these special precautions and leave the door open. Um, healthcare workers that come in contact with the patient should wear a mask or a respiratory protective device. And again, um, the type of patients that would have airborne precautions perhaps would be a patient with TB or uh, chicken pox. Another type of transmission-based precautions is droplet precautions. This is where the infecting organism is transmitted by droplets. Um, an example of this would be pneumonia um, or meningococcal meningitis. In the case of droplet precautions, again, the patient needs to be in a private room or you could cohort them with someone that has the very same infecting organism but nothing else. 
um, again because it's transmitted by droplets. In this case you can have the door open because it's highly unlikely that a droplet will get from the patient's bed and way out the door which hopefully is across the room. Um, with droplet precautions you should maintain a spatial relationship or, or separation of three feet between the patient and the visitor. So there should be some uh, space again so the droplets have less chance of, of getting from patient to visitor. The nurse when caring for the patient should wear a face mask. And again the patient should wear a mask if they're transported or, or go outside the room. Again a good example of a patient who would need droplet precautions would be a patient with pneumonia. Let's talk about the next type of transmission uh, based precaution and these, these are contact precautions. Uh, a good example of a patient needing contact precautions are patients with multi-drug resistant organisms or MRSA. Um, in this case again a private room is required. The nurse would put on clean non-sterile gloves before entering the patient's room. The nurse would put on a gown if the nurse's uniform will have contact with the patient or surfaces in the room, again um, because that's where the organisms would stay. The nurse would be responsible for removing the gloves and the gown before leaving the room. They would stay in the room. And again a good example of a situation that would require contact precautions is MRSA. And again we're going to talk a little bit more about contact precautions as we talk about the different disease processes. So those are the type of um, precautions based on the mode of transmission. And again, it's an important topic, one well worth your time to kind of go back over and review, as is standard or barrier precautions. Let's now talk about communicable diseases of childhood. And the first communicable disease we're going to talk about is chickenpox. Now there is a, a vaccine now for chickenpox, but again, um, not everyone has had the vaccine. What you'll see, the clinical course that this runs is there is a pruritic rash, meaning an itchy rash that begins as a macule, which is a reddened area, develops into a papule, which is a raised area, then into a vesicle, which is a fluid-filled area. And this disease is spread by direct contact. So you can see where you would have contact type of or transmission-based precautions here. Now the thing to remember with chickenpox is, is it is communicable two days before the rash begins. So the child will be communicable even though you don't know the child is ill, although they, they might be fussy and, and have other symptoms, but they will not have the rash. It is important that the child be isolated, and I, I don't mean put in a room and, and put away, but kept away from other people until all the vesicles, the fluid-filled areas, have crusted over. What they use um, is for symptomatic relief of chickenpox is topical calamine lotion. And again, because the child is fussy and many times runs a low-grade fever, you will want to use an antipyretic. But the antipyretic of choice is Tylenol rather than aspirin. And this is an important co um, concept. They don't use aspirin with children following common viral illnesses because of the association of aspirin with Rye syndrome. Rye syndrome is characterized by cerebral edema and fatty changes of the liver. And again, they will detect Rye syndrome by a biopsy of the liver, but again, you don't use aspirin following or, or in, in combination with common viral illnesses in children because of the association with Rye syndrome. Okay, the second communicable disease um, of childhood we're gonna talk about is rubella. This is also called three-day measles or German measles. What happens is there's a maculopapular rash, again that's a red raised rash, on the face and then the rest of the body. This also is, uh, or this is spread by droplets, so again you would want to use droplet precautions here and contact precautions. It's important to isolate children with rubella from pregnant women because of its association with congenital anomalies of the fetus. And again the treatment for um, rubella is antipyretics and analgesics. Again, Tylenol, the antipyretic of choice. The next communicable disease of childhood is mononucleosis, also called the kissing disease. Um, what usually presents the clinical course is they, the person has flu-like aches, fever, they may have enlarged lymph nodes and may suffer a sore throat. The highest incidence of mono is seen in um, individuals between 15 and 30 years old. Mononucleosis is spread by direct contact with oral secretions, so it's important to avoid contact with saliva for a three-month period to prevent the transmission of the disease. 
Treatment for mononucleosis is rest and good nutrition. And the rest is especially important. If the individual, and again, remember we're dealing with a 15, 17-year-old who is a very active individual. If they engage in strenuous exercise, they run the risk of rupture of the spleen, which is a serious complication. So again, rest is of paramount importance in treatment of mononucleosis. The next communicable disease of childhood is tonsillitis. This will present with fever and usually a white exudate on the tonsillar area. It's treated with antibiotics, and the reason that this is, uh, or many times can be serious, is the potential complications include rheumatic fever and glomerulonephritis. nephritis. So untreated tonsillitis can cause significant complications. The next infectious or inflammatory disease we're going to talk about is um, tuberculosis, and this is a frequently tested topic on the NCLEX exam. And again, the incidence of tuberculosis is increasing in the United States. Let's talk first about the type of skin testing to determine whether or not the person has been infected with the tuberculosis bacillus. There's two types of skin testing. Um, the MANTU test, or the PPD, is um, the one that is in some cases less common, but it is a more specific test. This is where um, they actually do a, a bleb under the skin, and then they will check it in 48 to 72 hours. And when they check it, what they're looking for is an area of induration. And induration is a hardened spot under the skin. So rather than visually inspecting it, you'll actually feel to see if there's a hardened area, because that will tell you that there's a positive reaction. And if the hardened area is at least 10 millimeters or more, then that is positive for TB. Now, if the patient has AIDS or uh, immune problems, then any area greater than 5 millimeters of induration is a positive reaction to a MAN2 test. The more common test that they use for wide uh, screening is the multiple puncture test, also known as the TINE test. This is given intradermally. It's the kind of stamp or puncture test on the skin. Again, read in 48 to 72 hours. Let's talk about the symptoms of tuberculosis. If a patient has tuberculosis, they will usually present with fatigue, anorexia. Many times they will have had low-grade fevers. One of the characteristic signs is night sweats. They have a cough, and their cough is productive. And the sputum is mucopurulent, and many times it's streaked with blood, or they have actual hemoptysis, which is bloody sputum. And the patient may also complain of dyspnea, or difficulty breathing. The nursing care for tuberculosis requires or involves isolation. Remember, this is, is transmitted um, an airborne route. And the patient will remain on isolation for about two to four weeks until they are able to obtain three negative sputum cultures. Once they do, the patient will be taken off isolation. Now, all patients with tuberculosis need to be reported to the health department. And the reason for that is all the um, contacts or people who have come in contact with the person while they had the active form of the disease and were untreated will need to be evaluated. And what they will do is they will do screening on them with many times the TINE test or the MAN2 test to see if they um, actually came in contact with the tuberculosis bacillus. Now, teaching is an important component with dealing with patients with TB, and you should teach not only the patient, but the patient's families or significant others. They should use Kleenex instead of handkerchiefs, and the Kleenexes should be disposed of properly. The person should know to cover their nose and mouth when coughing or sneezing. It's important for them to take all their medications, and we're going to talk about medications in just a minute. Um, good nutrition is very important. Remember, we talked about the fact that anorexia is one of the si um, symptoms of TB. And also, the patient should know what to do to prevent the spread or the transmission of the disease. Let's talk about the medications used for tuberculosis. And we're going to talk about a patient who is being treated for active TB. They always use medications in combinations to prevent drug-resistant strains of tuberculosis from developing. So you will never see a patient with tuberculosis on just one medication. The medications of choice include isoniazid or INH, rifampin, ethambutol, and streptomycin. Again, remember, streptomycin is given IM. So again, they'll be used, the medications will be used in combination, and the patient will be on um, medications for a, a duration of about six to nine months, and it's very important that they remain compliant with the medication regime. 
Now patients are the contacts that have come in contact with them. If they converted from being um, a negative Tyne test or negative MAN2 test and converted to be seropositive, then they will put these particular individuals on a prophylactic um, regime of INH anyone who converts from negative to positive with the PPD. Again, that's to prevent the development of the disease. Let's go on and talk about hepatitis. Remember, hepatitis is an inflammatory disease of the liver. The type of symptoms you'll see with hepatitis are jaundice, where there will be yellow skin and sclera. The patient will have anorexia or loss of appetite. They will complain of right upper quadrant pain. They will begin to develop clay-colored stools and tea-colored urine. So essentially their stools will get light and their urine will get dark. They will complain of pruritus, which is the itching. And the reason for the itching is that the bile salts are being eliminated through the skin and that causes irritation. Patients with hepatitis will have altered or elevated liver enzymes and these are the ALT and the AST. They also may have an, a prolonged PT or prothrombin time bleeding time. That's because of the liver's involvement with the development of clotting factors. Let's talk about the transmission of hepatitis. Again, this is an important concept. It's important for you to know how the different types of hepatitis are transmitted so you can prevent the transmission. Um, the most frequently tested types of hepatitis are hepatitis A and hepatitis B. Now, hepatitis A is transmitted through the fecal or oral route. This is what you get when you consume either contaminated food or contaminated water. Uh, travelers to developing countries are at risk for developing hepatitis A. Clients with hepatitis A should not prepare foods for others because, again, that's a possible vector or mode of transmission of the disease. Now, hepatitis B you get from parenteral or sexual contact. It is transmitted via blood or body fluids. Uh, patients at risk for hepatitis B are, are individuals who abuse IV drugs, uh, patients on dialysis. Healthcare workers, because of our uh, continued use of sharps and, and needles and all, again, are at high risk for developing hepatitis B, which is why they have developed the vaccine. Now, hepatitis C, again, is transmitted via blood or body fluids. Um, this can become a chronic disease, which is a significant issue. And many times you'll see it with patients with hemophilia. Delta hepatitis, um, many times you'll see because it co-infects with hepatitis B. Again, the important thing to remember with the different types of hepatitis is the mode of transmission so you can prevent the spread. Let's talk about nursing care for hepatitis. First and foremost, it's important that the client rest. The liver has a tremendous power to regenerate, but it needs good nutrition and it needs rest. Again, the patient, because of the mode of transmission or depending on the mode of transmission, will be on contact and standard precautions. The type of diet, again, we said nutrition is very important. The patient will be on a low-fat, high-calorie, high-protein diet, and that's needed for organ healing. Patients with hepatitis, um, alcoholic beverages are prohibited. And there are several medications the patient will take. Again, you might say, well, wait a minute. Doesn't the liver detoxify medications? Well, yes, it does. So you would limit the number of medications, or hopefully the number of medications the patient would be taking would be limited, but there are some that are used. For example, um, vitamin K or aquamephitin would be used if the patient experiences bleeding problems. Many times the patients suffer from nausea and vomiting, so an antiemetic would be used. They don't use copazine, but they might use Tigan or Dramamine. Um, many times they will use corticosteroids to decrease the inflam inflammation or inflammatory response, or antihistamines. And again, if they use antihistamines, they're more likely to be ointments, lotions, or baths than, a, than something that's taken systemically. The next infection we're going to talk about is Lyme's disease. Now, Lyme's disease is a multi-system infection caused by a tick bite. And there are three stages to Lyme's disease. Stage one is the, where there is an erythematosus papule that develops into a lesion with a clear center or a bullseye. Essentially, that means there's a reddened area um, that's raised. It's a papule that has a clear center. And, and again, a bullseye is a very good uh, description of this. This usually will develop at the site of the bite from the tick between 2 and 30 days. And after time, concentric rings or rings around it will develop again, which makes it look very much like a bullseye. Patients with stage 1 Lyme disease many times suffer from re regional lymphadenopathy, and they may complain of flu-like symptoms, such as fever, 
headache, or conjunctivitis. Now, stage one in these type of symptoms can develop over one to several months. Stage two, Lyme's disease, um, this will develop after one to six months if the disease is untreated. And the problem is that many times individuals are, un are unsure, don't know that they have been bit by the tick, so they don't even know that there's a problem. They just know that they don't feel good and they've got flu and something is going on. And many times this disease is picked up during stage two because of the cardiac conduction defects. Um, there was a situation in the hospital where a patient presented with a pulse of about 45. Again, um, with stage two Lyme's disease, and yes, he had gone hiking in, in the woods two months previously. They may also suffer in stage two of neurological disorders such as Bell's palsy with a type of temporary paralysis. With stage three, they will complain of arthralgias um, and they will have enlarged inflamed joints. Again, stage three develops you know, between one and several months. The problem with stage three, if it gets that far, is it may persist for several years. Now, Lyme's disease, the best way to deal with it is not to have to deal with it, which is to prevent it. So um, one of the teaching you want to do for patients or, or individuals who hike and climb and rappel and that type of thing is to cover any exposed areas when they're in wooded areas and, and exposed areas on their body. They should wear a long sleeve shirt and, and long pants and, and cover areas where uh, ticks may come in. Um, and then after they come in from the woods um, into the camp you know, that type of thing, they should check all exposed areas and around waistbands and all for the presence of ticks. Again, nursing care for Lyme's disease, once it has um, been diagnosed, is the patient will be put on a course of antibiotics for three to four weeks. Many times with stage one, they will use doxycycline um, with an IV penicillin with some of the later stages. Let's talk about sexually transmitted diseases, or STDs. Um, there are several different types of sexually transmitted diseases, and it is important that you know the differences. Um, this is a frequently tested topic on the NCLEX. Let's talk first about syphilis. What you'll see with syphilis is a painless canker that fades after about six weeks. The patient may also have a low-grade fever and may have a coppered-colored rash on the palms of their hands and the soles of their feet. Syphilis is spread by um, contact with mucous membranes and it also is spread congenitally. It's treated with penicillin GIM and if the patient has a penicillin allergy, they will use erythromycin for 10 to 15 days. And the important thing with treatment of syphilis is after the course of treatment, the patient should be retested to make sure that, they, that they've been cured, that the disease has gone away. Let's talk next about gonorrhea. Um, with gonorrhea there, if you're a female, you may be totally asymptomatic and be unaware that you have the disease. Um, more likely with males, they will have a thick discharge from the urethra. Some females, again, have a thick discharge from the vagina. This disease is also spread by contact with mucous membranes and is also spread congenitally. The type of treatment they use for gonorrhea is IM rosefin and doxycycline PO. They also can use IM aqueous penicillin, and when they do that, usually combine it with PO probenicid. You remember probenicid is a medication used for gout, and the reason they use it with the IM aqueous penicillin is it delays the urinary excretion of the penicillin, so it makes the medication, the penicillin, more effective. Now, a complication with, of untreated gonorrhea is PID, or pelvic inflammatory disease. Now, many times with gonorrhea, they have a concomitant infection with chlamydia. In about 45% of the cases, again, they're infected with chlamydia. And in that case, they'll use PO tetracycline. The next sexually transmitted disease we'll talk about is genital herpes. Now, with genital herpes, there is no cure, and usually the patient will present with painful vesicular lesions in the genital area. A problem with genital herpes is there, is there are exacerbations and remissions, and the disease will reoccur with stress, infection, and at the type of time of a woman's menses. Again, this sexually transmitted disease is spread by contact with mucous membranes and also congenitally. The treatment for this, again, remember there's no cure, but the treatment, they use a cyclovar and they use sitz baths. Now, with genital herpes, there is a higher incidence than usual of cervical cancer, so they need very frequent pap smears, pap smears to evaluate for that. With genital herpes, because there is no cure, again, emotional support for the client and significant others are very important. 
Now, if a person or a woman with genital herpes is going to deliver a child, because it can spread congenitally, if the woman has active disease, they will perform a C-section. The next sexually transmitted disease is chlamydia. In men, they will have urethritis and dysuria. Women will experience a thick vag vaginal discharge with an acrid odor. Again, this sexually transmitted disease is spread by contact with mucous membranes. The type of treatment they use is tetracycline or doxycycline PO, and this disease may cause sterility if left untreated. Again, with this disease and all the sexually transmitted diseases, it's very important to notify the sexual contacts so they can come in and be tested. The last sexually transmitted disease we're going to talk about is venereal warts. Venereal warts are small papillary lesions that spread into large kind of cauliflower clusters on the perineum, vaginal, or penis. Again, papillary is a, is a raised area. They also may itch or burn. Venereal warts are spread by contact with mucous membranes and also congenitally. The type of treatment they use for venereal warts are curatage and cryotherapy or, or, or burning or removing with liquid nitrogen. They also use keratolytic agents to remove them. Now, when the patient has venereal warts, you want to avoid intimate contact until the lesions are healed. And there is a strong association of venereal warts with genital dysplasia and cancer. So it's very important that these individuals have frequent um, checkups with the medical community. Again, it's important to notify sexual contacts. Let's move on from sexually transmitted disease and talk about both AIDS and HIV-positive patients. Now, there's a difference between AIDS and HIV positive, and let's talk about that for just a minute. A patient is HIV positive when they have the HIV virus present in their blood, and that's, that's it. If you're HIV positive, you have the virus present in your blood. Now, AIDS is a little bit more than that. Um, when you talk about AIDS, it is where there are significant defects in the immune function it is associated with the HIV virus, and it is evidenced by development of what they call opportunistic infections. So again, AIDS, there are significant defects in immune function, and it is associated with the HIV virus, but it is evidenced by opportunistic infections. It's a syndrome um, where the CD4 counts um, are usually below 200. And let's Let's talk about the opportunistic infections associated with AIDS. The first one is P. carinae pneumonia, or PCP. Patients with PCP will have shortness of breath and a dry, non-productive cough. A second opportunistic infection is C. albicon stomatitis. Again, patients with this particular opportunistic infection will have difficulty swallowing, and you'll see the white exudate on the back of their throat. C. neformans, again, is a debilitating uh, type of meningitis, and patients with this opportunistic infection may suffer seizures. Another opportunistic infection is CMV, or cytomegalovirus. Patients with this will experience lymph adenopathy. They may have visual impairment, and it can affect any organ. The last type of opportunistic infection is Kaposi sarcoma. This is the most common malignancy experienced by patients with AIDS. And it's experienced or evidenced by small purplish brown, um, non-painful, non-paritic, palpable lesions on the body. Again, small purplish brown, non-painful, non-paritic, palpable lesions on the body. It's quite disfiguring. Transmission of AIDS. It's much best, better if we prevent the transmission than having to deal with AIDS. Um, it's important that you know how AIDS is transmitted because it will um, determine the nursing care and the type of transmission precautions we use when caring with patients with AIDS. AIDS is transmitted by contaminated blood or body fluids. It's transmitted by sharing of IV needles. It's transmitted by sexual contact. It is transmitted transplacentally, meaning across the placenta, and also possibly by breast milk. Now the time from exposure to the development of symptoms is a long time and it can vary, but it can be up to and including eight to 10 years. Now the way that AIDS is not transmitted is by um, clothes, washing the clothes of someone with 
family members or um, having the family member with AIDS prepare food for somebody. It's not like hepatitis A. Again, it, you know, it's blood and, and body fluid um, is how it's contaminated or how it's transmitted. Um, if there is a blood spill, again, it should be cleaned up with uh, to prevent transmission. Now, the diagnostic test associated with AIDS is first is the ELISA, which is the enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. And if that test is positive, it will be confirmed by the Western blot test. They will do an HIV viral culture, and patients with AIDS usually have leukopenia, which is a decrease in white blood cells. They also have thrombocytopenia, which is a decrease in platelets. And again, they also have a decrease in the CD4 counts. The nursing care for AIDS, again, best to do prevention, uh, avoiding IV drug use, precautions regarding sexual partners, uh, use of standard or barrier precautions will prevent the development of AIDS. Patients that have AIDS, again, we talked about how it's transmitted. So these patients should have contact and standard precautions. It's unnecessary to suit up um, like a, it's a chemical spill to go in and, and talk with the patient with AIDS. Um, because the virus is only transmitted certain ways. Uh, patients with AIDS need to be on a high protein, high calorie diet, and m it's much more likely that they will do better with small frequent meals rather than three large meals. A lot of the AIDS care deals with the symptomatic treatment of whatever the patient is experiencing. Uh, some patients have severe diarrhea. Again, you would give symptomatic treatment there. Some patients have the stomatitis or, you know, the inflammation of the mouth. Again, you would give symptomatic treatment there. There's a lot of support involved with AIDS for both the patient that has the disease and their family and significant others. Um, again, there's teaching involved. Um, you need to let the patient and, and the family and other people know you know, that they shouldn't share toothbrushes, they shouldn't share electric razors. Um, any uh, article that may contain blood should not be shared, but the person can make meals and participate in family and, and events with friends. Um, rest is important, again, um, to help the patient cope. A good exercise program is important, again, to tolerance. Um, what you want to do with AIDS is prevent any secondary infection. So it's it's good to keep the patient in good health, and you want to involve community agencies. Okay, we're going to change topics now, and we're going to talk about poison control. Now, poison control is a frequently tested topic on the NCLEX, um, and again, and we're talking a lot about prevention today, uh, prevention is most important. It's a whole lot easier to prevent poisoning than it is to deal with it. Most likely, um, when you think of poisoning, most of us think of children. Uh, children are creative and curious individuals. Um, they get into things. Um, we'll talk about, or with prevention, you want to, uh, people talk about child-proofing their homes. Uh, some people spend a lot of money and have an agency or a, a company come in and do that. Um, may, may not be necessary. What you want to do to child-proof your home is get down on the level of the child and look around and see what type of enticing things you see, see what type of of mischief you could get into and, and then um, prevent those type of areas or, or deal with those particular areas. But yeah, get down at their level and, and look around. Um, proper storage. Um, medication should never be left on counters, um, should never be left unattended just for a minute while I go in and get a cup of water because the child will help themselves to the pills. You don't want to take medications in front of children because they don't may not understand that they're pills and they may think you're just eating something and it looks like fun and they're hungry and they think they'd like a couple of those orange things too. Um, you don't want to leave medications in your purse because again I remember as a child what an adventure to go look in my mother's purse and, and find things. Um, again proper supervision is very important again with children. Well if you can't prevent the poisoning or for some reason something happened and it wasn't prevented then you need to deal with the poisoning event and the major concept is you deal with the patient first and the poison second. Again, your, the patient is your main concern here. And what you want to do is be able to recognize signs and symptoms of accidental poisoning. And what you're looking for are changes in appearance or in behavior. Um, you may look for unusual substances in the child's hands or, or around their mouth. Um, you may look for burns or blisters around the mouth. Um, you may find empty containers. Um, you may find some vomitus. Um, again, those would be signs or symptoms of accidental poisoning. 
So what do you do? Well, first and foremost, you call the Poison Control Center. Every house that has any individual living inside should have the Poison Control Center number prominently placed. Um, again, because and when you call the Poison Control Center, what you need to provide for them or what they're going to need to know is what substance was ingested and when, meaning how long ago, and the amount, four pills versus 20 pills, and the rod of ingestion. The child ate them, drank it, you know, whatever. They're also going to need to know the individual, and many times it's a child, their condition, what are they doing now, um, also their age and their weight. And if the child vomits or, or defecates or, or urinates, you need to save those and send those to the hospital with the child. Now, when you call the Poison Control Center, um, sometimes they will say to you, induce vomiting. Um, and sometimes they will say, don't. And let's talk about the reasons why vomiting would not be done following a poisoning. You would not induce vomiting. And again, the poison control people would tell you that. But if for some reason you couldn't get a hold of them and, and didn't know, you would never induce vomiting if there was the danger of aspiration. This would mean if the child or the person involved had a diminished gag reflex, if they had a decreased level of consciousness, if, if they were unconscious, again, you would never induce vomiting because of the danger of aspiration. If the child or the individual ingested a petroleum distillate, um, lighter fluid, kerosene, paint remover, again, some of that smells um, I guess enticing and a child may drink it just to see what it tastes like. But again, none of these would ever be, you would never induce vomiting because of the um, danger or the high risk of aspiration pneumonia that would be associated with that activity. And the last reason that you would not induce vomiting would be if the child ingested a corrosive such as drain cleaner. Uh, what happens is, it, just like in drains, it, it eats the tissue on the way down and if you induce vomiting, the tissue that wasn't destroyed on the way down would be destroyed on the way back up. So again, that you would get double the, the damage here in the esophagus and you don't want to do that. But there was a poisoning, you called the poison control center and they said induce vomiting because it wasn't a petroleum distillate and it wasn't a corrosive, the child um, ate a bottle of baby aspirin or, or, or had baby aspirin. They will tell you to induce vomiting, and what you will use is serpivipacac. Um, serpivipacac is a, um, an, an emetic that um, encourages or stimulates the vomiting center. Um, and you will follow the ipecac with a small amount of water, about four to eight ounces of clear fluid, usually water. What you don't want to do is you don't want to give the child a large amount of fluid after the ipecac because what that will do is it will increase gastric emptying and rather than you may want to get it through the system but you want to get it out of the system by vomiting rather than through the system by being absorbed. And with a small amount of fluid that will not increase gastric emptying and will not speed drug absorption. You don't use milk. Again, one of the old wives tales is you use milk with the poisoning. That is not true. You also should have a bottle of Ipecac in your house for every individual who lives there. That, uh, if four people live there, there should be four bottles lined up on, on the shelf. Now, when you induce vomiting after you give the syrup of Ipecac, again, to a person who is totally coherent and is, is not non-responsive, you need to make sure and position their head lower than their chest because, again, you don't want them to aspirate. And, again, we talked about the reason you don't give large amounts of fluid. Now, the problem with poisoning is that there's no universal antidote. Um, there are specific antidotes for some things, but no universal antidote. So let's talk about the emergency care. Um, the poisoning has happened. You called the poison control center. They said induced vomiting. You did that, and now the, the child or the person is being transported to the hospital. The emergency care after a poisoning, first and foremost, you need to remember your ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation. First of all, the, the patient or the client will be intubated if they're comatose. They will run blood gases to see what's going on. They will put in an IV line again to maintain fluid and electrolytes and hydration. Um, they will hook the person up to a cardiac monitor. This is especially important if the person took a tricyclic antidepressant or a phenothiazide because they interfere with cardiac function. If uh, they feel it's necessary, they may institute what they call a gastric lavage. They will pass a, a large um, NG tube down and flush it with normal saline until clear to remove uh, the rest of the poison that's in the stomach. They may also use activated charcoal. And activated charcoal, again, is used after vomiting has been um, instituted. And what they do with 
um, activated charcoal is it's a substance that is either drank or put down in the stomach via an NG tube that um, absorbs all the rest of the poison that is there. It, it puts it into compounds that are non-absorbable, non-absorbable so it can be f uh, taken out of the body without activated by the body. And many times they will use the activated charcoal an hour or so after the ingestion. Other ways they can deal with poisonings in the acute phase is they can use cathartics, um, which uh, would stimulate diarrhea. Again, that would speed um, the poison through the system um, and speed it through the GI tract. They may also use diuretics, such as Lasix. These would be used to help eliminate the, the poison by the kidneys. And they can also use chelating agents, um, which are used for heavy metals, um, such as mercury or, or lead. They use the chelating agents. Again, the best thing to do with regard to poisoning is to prevent its occurrence. So teaching people about you know, how to store medications and how to childproof the house is, is the best way to go. Let's talk about a couple of specific type of poisoning situations. Um, the first one is aspirin poisoning. Most hospital or most ho homes have aspirin, and, and many times people take it periodically. And the child may may have the adult may have accidentally left the bottle on the counter, and the child takes several aspirin. The symptoms they will show with aspirin over dosage is the tinnitus or the ringing in the ears. There will be a change in mental status. There may be an increased temperature. The child may hyperventilate or the person may hyperventilate and go into respiratory alkalosis. Later on, because um, aspirin is acetoacylic acid, they will go into metabolic acidosis because of the ingestion of the um, acids. Also because aspirin decre decreases platelet aggregation, the client with an aspirin overdosage may have bleeding disorders and they may suffer from nausea and vomiting. So let's talk about what you do. Again, well, if you called or when you call the poison control center, what they will tell you is to induce vomiting. This is not a petroleum distillate. This is not a corrosive. There's no reason why you don't want the child to vomit. In fact, you want the child to get rid of as much as possible of the aspirin that they've taken. So they will induce vomiting. They will maintain hydration, and they will do that by using IV fluids. They want to reduce the child's temperature, and the first thing that comes to mind is, well, let's give them some an antipyretic, such as aspirin, well, not, not going to happen here. There's already too much aspirin, which is why the tem temperature regulation center is off. In this case, you would use the old tried and true method of temp tepid sponge baths. You also want to monitor for bleeding. Again, remember we said that aspirin decreases platelet aggregation. So the person with an aspirin overdosage may have bleeding uh, problems. Another type of frequent poisoning is Tylenol poisoning. So maybe they didn't leave aspirin on the counter, they left a bottle of Tylenol. Now the type of symptoms you'll see in the first couple of hours after a Tylenol overdosage is nausea and vomiting, hypothermia. And what happens is um, if there is no treatment, the Tylenol destroys the liver. That's the major danger with Tylenol poisoning or overdosage is the liver damage that takes place. Now, if there's no treatment, then after the first couple of hours and the liver gets involved, there may, might be right upper quadrant pain. The patient may begin to experience jaundice, confusion, and coagulation abnormalities, again, because of what the liver does with clotting factors. Now, the nursing care for Tylenol poisoning, again, you want to induce vomiting. No reason why the, the person shouldn't vomit out and not have the medication absorbed. Again, you want to maintain hydration with IV fluids. And here, um, there is an actual antidote. Um, Mucomist is an antidote for Tylenol overdosage, so that would be used. And over time, you want to monitor liver and kidney function. This is your AST and your ALT enzymes to make sure that um, there's not a, a problem with them. And if there is liver involvement, it usually develops over time. Okay, another type of poisoning, and this type of poisoning is frequently tested on the NCLEX exam, and that's lead toxicity. Symptoms you'll see of lead toxicity are irritability, decreased activity. Usually the child will become very lethargic. They may have abdominal pain. They may have increased intracranial pressure, and this would be seen by them experiencing either seizures or altered motor function. 
Now, diagnostic tests for lead toxicity, they will do blood lead levels, and it would be considered positive for poisoning or toxicity anything over nine micrograms. Another test they would do is the EP, which is the erythrocyte potoporphyrin level, and they also x-ray long bones. What happens with lead ingestion is it many times is deposited in the long bones. And when you do an x-ray, you'll see what they call lead lines, where you can actually see the lead deposits in the long bones. Now, one of the reasons or, or uh, problems with lead poisoning is that many times uh, children will ingest substances that contain lead because they engage in what is called pica. Pica is the eating of non-food food substances, such as mud, uh, paint chips, uh, plaster, because you'll see lead or we find lead in lead-based paint. Uh, most of the paint now is not lead-based. They have changed that, but many of the older buildings still have lead-based paint on the walls. Uh, crumbling plaster contains lead. Uh, some pottery is glazed with a lead glaze. So again, you need to be careful if you go to that uh, flea market and find this wonderful uh, soup terrain that's ceramic and you feed your family out of it, you need to make sure that it's not leaching lead um, into the soup. Also some pewter um, contains lead and you wouldn't want to use pewter um, serving utensils because again the, dan the danger of, of lead toxicity. The problem with lead or what happens with lead is it blocks the formation of hemoglobin and it's also toxic to the kidneys. Um, children who ingest lead um, end up with severe, either mild, moderate, or severe mental retardation, and, and that's a significant problem. So let's talk about the nursing care with lead toxicity. First of all, you need to figure out where it's coming from, and it may be that wonderful soup terrine that, you know, the mother keeps using. Um, it's leaching into the soup. So you need to find out where it's coming from, where the child is in a, at a daycare center or a sitter um, where they have an old, an old whatever with crumbling paint on it and the child's been eating the paint chips. What they do is they use chelating agents, and we talked about that again when we talked about the type of medications, such as uh, BAL and oil is a chelating agent that um, helps remove lead. Also, a big issue here is teaching with the parents teach them how to prevent um, lead uh, poisoning, how to, how to deal with it if it occurs. Okay, we finished our discussion of poisoning. Now we're going to talk about poisoning on a much larger level. We're going to talk about hazardous waste. Now dealing with hazardous waste, there are um, four nursing goals, nursing care goals. First of all and foremost, you want to decontaminate the individual. Second is you want to prevent the spread of contamination. Third is you want to both clean and remove the contaminated source. And the last goal is you want to monitor the personnel who are exposed uh, to the hazardous waste. And again, first and foremost is you want to decontaminate and deal with the individual. Let's talk about nursing care regarding hazardous waste. And this would be nursing care for the person who has been contaminated. Now, if the chemical poses a threat to the caregiver, you would decontaminate the patient first. Otherwise, you're going to end up with two patients. But if the chemical poses a threat to the caregiver, you want to decontaminate the patient first. Now, if the chemical poses no threat to the caregiver, or if the patient has been decontaminated, then you will begin care. Now, if there is an immediate threat to life of the individual, the caregiver should put on protective garments and provide care to stabilize the client. Now with the hazardous waste, uh, many times the nurse will be on the receiving end of this. The nurse will be in a hospital setting where the person comes in having been exposed to a hazardous waste. And one of the most important things to do is to get ready for the patient coming in. Um, you need to prepare the area where the patient will be decontaminated. That means you need to close vents, um, close doors, um, cover the floor. Again, you want to prevent the spread. The other thing is the patient is decontaminated. You want to remove their clothing. About 95% of the contamination is contained on someone's clothing. So you want to do that. The next thing you want to do is make sure they shampoo their hair well. Because again, the other 5% probably or 3% is, is in the hair area. Again, so you want to go through the decontamination process so that the person um, poses no threats to themselves or others. 
Let's talk about accident prevention. Earlier in the discussion of safe and effective care, I talked about the fact that nursing care in the United States is based on health promotion, wellness, and illness prevention. So this is a very timely topic and again one that is frequently tested. When you deal with accident prevention, there really are two issues. One is teaching and one is awareness. Let's go through it and we'll go through it uh, chronologically, if you will. We'll start with a newborn. Um, accident prevention for a newborn would be placing that infant or newborn in a rear-facing car seat. It would be crib safety to make sure that the slats are, if you're using grandmother's crib, make sure the slats are uh, the, a distance away where the child cannot, when they move around, get, get lodged in the crib. Uh, you shouldn't smoke in front of newborn infants or even any children or really any adults because of the increased risk of an upper respiratory tract infection. Again, um, environmental safety with the use of lead-free paint and that type of thing comes into play here. With an infant um, and you're giving an infant baths, you want to check water temperature. The water temperature should be between 120, 120 and 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, again, you know, the wrist-elbow uh, way of monitoring temperatures before you would immerse the child in water should be used. Infants um, many times will put things in their mouth, and again, there's choking hazards with very small uh, pieces of, uh, of toys or buttons or coins around the house. Let's talk about toddlers. Um, the infant or the child is now mobile, um, which opens up a whole new realm of, of accident prevention. Um, we talked about child-proofing the home, um, getting down at the child's level and actually looking around and making sure that anything that looks enticing um, is locked up, put away, you know, out of the child's reach. Uh, safety gates, you know, good supervision. It takes uh, a toddler about a, a second and a half to get from point A to point B. All you have to do is turn your back and, and the child may be in a dangerous situation. By this time, the child is about 20 pounds and they should be in a front-facing car seat and that car seat should be in the back seat of the car. Again, you know, putting car seats in the front seat of the car with airbags is a, a dangerous proposition. When children or infants or toddlers grow up and get to be children, again, a whole new issue with accident prevention. Um, many times children ride bikes, uh, bike safety, the, the rules of the road, if you will. Uh, when the child stands on a bike, their feet should be able to touch the ground so they are not wobbling in, in um, off center. They should wear helmets when, whenever riding a bike, again, to prevent one of the most common injuries, which is a head injury when a child falls from a bicycle. Sports safety, because many times children are playing in competitive sports or even recreational sports. They should use the proper protective equipment when they're engaging in this type of activity. Um, wearing socks, running around the house with hardwood floors, again, they should have non-stick bottoms. Uh, swimming pool safety, to make sure that the swimming pool gates are secure or the pool is covered when it's not in use. Let's talk about adolescents. Um, adolescents believe that they are indestructible. Um, they are invincible. So again, it, it opens a whole new area of accident prevention. Um, driving safety is an issue because these children are um, now growing up are mobile and in many cases they're driving uh, the, the family car. At, um, anger again gets to be an issue with adolescents. They have a lot of conflicting emotions and uh, many times they don't know how exactly to deal with them. So teaching um, an adolescent appropriate ways to deal with anger again is, is um, a prevention method. Um, with adults, we get into issues such as handgun control, um, having trigger locks on if you have a handgun in your house, not storing the bullets with the gun, um, not having the gun in the bedside table next to your bed um, where children can get it. Um, responsible sexual behavior to prevent uh, sexually transmitted diseases and, and some of those other issues. Um, providing for environmental safety such as having smoke and carbon monoxide um, detectors in the home and, and places of business so again to, to keep people safe. When you get to the elderly, the elderly because of changes in sensation and changes in mobility are at a higher risk for injury. They have changes in balance. Um, their reaction times are slower. So again, they have more need for uh, prevention. Um, with mobility, they need to, in some cases, have handrails or assistive devices such as walkers or, or canes. Um, they need to have a good exercise program, um, you know, where they can kind of get around. 
Uh, you should do a house inventory with the elderly and look around. Are there rugs on the floor? If so, they probably should be removed. Is there sufficient lights and hallways and, and stairways? Uh, you should teach an elderly person how to go up and down the stairs, and it doesn't include going up and down the stairs with their arms filled with sheets or towels. Uh, that's a recipe for danger. Uh, making sure they have good shoes, good supportive shoes with non-skid skid soles on it is helpful. Um, cleaning pathways, not leaving things on the ground. Um, good lighting, again, because of the decrease in visual acuity that comes with aging. So again, accident prevention, very, very important and frequently tested topic on the NCLEX. Let's talk about our last topic, which is disaster planning. Now, the biggest component or the biggest concept with disaster planning is to do the greatest amount of good for the greatest number of people. And you want to use the resources because, again, resources are limited. You want to use them for patients that have the greatest probability of survival. So what they do is something called triage. With triage, you determine the order that people are going to be treated. Um, it's kind of like the MASH scene if, if you watch uh, MASH reruns on television. Uh, patients that are tagged red are unstable patients. These would be patients such as someone who is short of breath or, or with bleeding, um, actively bleeding. A yellow patient is a patient who is more stable and they can wait. This might be a broken bone or, or someone with a burn. Now a green patient is even more stable and they can wait longer. Um, these we may refer to or many times refer to as the walking wounded. Uh, someone with a sore back or a hangnail or something that um, doesn't require emergency treatment. Now the black patients are, are harder patients to deal with. These are the unstable patients that are probably or probably have sustained a fatal injury. Um, again, because our resources are limited and we want to do the best we can for the most number of people, uh, we would not care for the black early in our succession of, of treatment because they um, are less likely to survive and you would spend all of your time with one patient rather than caring for five or six or, or ten patients. And the DOA patients, um, dead on admission patients, again, um, are, would be put to the side um, and the living would be cared for um, according to their acuity. Now, when you're dealing with disaster planning and all, everyone becomes a generalist. Um, you deal with basic issues, um, uh, specific basic issues rather than, you know, you do must-dos rather than nice-to-dos. Um, and again, the ABCs, you know, airway, breathing, circulation. You want to get your patient stable and moved out so you can, you know, again, get the greatest amount of good for the greatest amount of people. Well, that concludes our discussion of safe and effective care, safety, and infection control. Thank you for spending this time with us today.